Hey folks, Randy Newberg here with another episode of Leopold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, Today is an interesting podcast. I have no idea where it's going to head or lead or end, but uh, I read an article written by a friend of mine who has been a past guest on this uh, podcast, Nicole Qualtieri. Qualtieri. Nicole, why can I never say your name? Uh, NKQ, I guess is what we'll just say. That's her handle out on Instagram. Uh, Anyhow, Nicole is the hunting fishing editor for gearjunkie.com. And she wrote this article about uh, five things that we need to get over with regard to sports women or something like that or uh, get beyond or something like that. I'll pull it up here, but uh, it was five interesting issues from the perspective of women who hunt, and I read it, and then I saw how many people were sharing it online. I thought, hmm, there must be something to this, not just in my eyes, but in the eyes of others. So I instantly sent a text to Nicole and said, uh, hey, Nicole, let's do a podcast about this. Um, it's been three, four years since you've been on. Let's, let's talk about this because the, the reality is we are all a, a product of our life experience and how we see the world and how we interpret what is being communicated and messaged is a function of the lens formed by those life experiences. And being a guy... I'm going to have a different lens just because I'm going to have different life experiences. So when I told Nicole uh, I wanted to do this, uh, she said, uh, yeah, uh, but I'd like to have a couple of my friends join me. And I said, all the better. Uh, So with her today uh, are Sarah Keller. Uh, Sarah is a writer who I've had the fortunate experience of being interviewed by her for a a meat eater piece one time. Uh, And then a new person who I've not met before, uh, Lindsay Mulcair. Uh, Lindsay is a professional photographer and they have come to hunting. So I, I... a little perspective and I'm sure we'll get into this, but Lindsay and Sarah have come up through the hunting ranks as, uh, I guess from families that had hunting cultures. Nicole came to it, uh, kind of later, uh, through her own interest and, and, uh, effort. So I, like I said, I have no idea where the discussion is going to lead. We're going to talk about uh, Nicole's article, but not the article itself, as much as the five topics and a general discussion about where does hunting have this uh, problem, its opportunities, its possibilities uh, with regard to the group that is definitely the minority of the hunting demographic, that being women. Um, and I'm always interested to hear the hunting stories from the perspective of women. They, they open my eyes differently. They, they cause me to, they'll say certain things that cause my lifetime. I'm just traveling down the road as a guy. Uh, the, the, one of them will say something. I'm like, oh, why didn't I ever think about that before? Um, so anyhow, we're going to sit here and have a talk about it. And guess that's where it's going. <laughs> I don't know where, but uh, I want to thank Leopold for, first of all, being such a great supporter of public lands, of conservation, of this podcast, of all the things we do, and for making such fantastic optics. Uh, go to leopold.com, whether it's observation uh, optics like binos and spotters, or obviously they're world famous for their gold ring rifle scopes, uh, range finders, you name it. Loophole has it, and uh, we're thankful to have them. And then we have Go Hunt. Uh, GoHunt.com right now has a 30-day free trial for their insider. Uh, we're recording this in early August. I think through August and September, that 30-day free trial is going to continue. And with that, you, you go to GoHunt.com forward slash Randy. 
and you're going to get a chance to use this insider service that we talk about so much. So 30 days, no cost, nothing, just give it a whirl. Uh, right now there's some really cool strategy articles out there and besides the draw odds that everybody's interested in, I would suggest you go read the strategy articles, uh, mostly by Brady and trail. Those two guys are unbelievable when it comes to strategies about getting tags, about opportunities you may not have known exist. So go hunt.com forward slash Randy and you'll get a 30 day free trial. And then also, while you're there, check out their gear shop. They have a world-class backcountry hunting gear shop. And right now, you can use promo code RANDY. And when you check out, you are going to get 10% off your purchase. Just type in RANDY and 10% off. Yeah, there you go. Save some money already. <clears throat> and then we have Orion Coolers. Uh, they want you to save some money also. So if you go to OrionCoolers.com and you buy one of these really, really amazing coolers, and when you check out, again, use promo code RANDY, and you're going to save 20%. I mean, we're making you money today, folks. I mean, you're going to be able to go down to Dairy Queen with all the money we're saving you. And then last and certainly never least is Onyx Maps. Uh, we're getting ready, I believe, in a couple of days, we're going to launch our first of our new four. We did four new episodes with them this year about hands-on e-scouting. In other words, how we do it, what, what the whole strategy is for putting together the 12 videos that we did last year. Here's what it looks like when we're done. Uh, the first one launches uh, this week, I think. Um, on X. I'd, <laughs> I don't know how I would apply or hunt without them. Uh, I wouldn't even want to try. And uh, they will let you save some money also. I mean, if you're going to be part of any of my podcasts, you're going to let my listeners save money. So go to uh, on X. Uh, yeah, not, not on X maps. Yeah. On X maps.com. See, we call them on X. So I always drop, the maps part. They're just called OnX. So I don't want to send you to OnX.com. I want to send you to OnXMaps.com. And when you buy app products, again, use promo code Randy and save yourself 20%. Man, I got to get some more people who want to uh, let you save some money. Uh, when I get them, I'll throw them into another podcast or another platform or something. But in the meantime, uh, we have three really wonderful people here who've taken time out of their personal schedules in an evening to join me for this podcast. Uh, Nicole, Sarah, Lindsay, really appreciate it. Uh, as quick as I hit the button here, the audience is, uh, we're going to be live. So all the chatter uh, is going to be recorded. Don't say anything that you wouldn't say if you knew you were being recorded. So thanks for being here, folks. Appreciate you listening and, and tuning in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is good stuff. So when I met my my now husband, he was shocked that I owned guns. Um, it was almost a deal breaker for him. Um, and now I think he owns more guns than I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, by Mission far. Mission accomplished. Yeah. And... He's taking his hunter's ed this fall with, with my daughter, um, side by side. So, How cool is that? Yeah. Huh. Well, I just like the image of him sitting in a classroom of 12 and 13 year olds. Oh yeah. He's going to freak out. It's like, <laughs> I'm really, I need a picture of it. I need film and I like just uh, need it to be recorded. Yeah. So we jumped into this folks right in the middle of it. Um, <laughs> I am the, I, uh, I, how do I explain this without sounding like? Mm. You're surrounded by women. Well, that's <laughs> going to be obvious. But uh, Nicole wrote this article uh, that caused me to think about the. Is there some weirdness? I don't know if that's the right word to call it. I'll call it weirdness about men being surprised that women hunt. Was, is that a good way to put it? I mean, I think the, however you interpret it uh, is is fine. I I wanted to put something out there that at least called attention to the experience that I felt that I had 
and that I had talked with other women and and I didn't want to feel crazy because I think that sometimes the first thing that you feel is like I'm experiencing like is there something that I'm doing like is this personal like but the second thing you think of is okay like if it is about gender then other women are probably experiencing it so mm-hmm. it it was going to other women in the industry mm-hmm. and um saying hey, is this something that's happened to you? And like, not only had it happened to them, it had happened to them just as often, if not more often, than it had happened to me. So um, I ran this article before... In Gear Junkie. In Gear Junkie, You're the hunt and fish editor of Gear Junkie, right? Yeah. And does that, do I have that title Uh right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm Nicole Qualtieri, hunting and... Hunting and fishing it. Uh, yeah, for, for I'm, 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 yeah, I'll do. <laughs> I've already done the later. introductions in a different file, Nicole, but oh, okay. you, you were fashionably late. <laughs> oh, okay. <I laughs> Isn't that what it. you said when you came in? I, you were yeah, fashionably yeah, late. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But anyhow, when I reached out to you, because you've been on this podcast before. Uh, um, yeah, if you, before I'd even killed anything. Yeah. How did you let that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, this is the before and after version, oh, yeah, and now no, we've got two of your friends here to uh, uh, verify or or keep you honest because part of <laughs> I, I don't think it's a gender thing about hunters and anglers. Maybe well, I don't either, and that's really so. the whole point of the article is like if we can get past some of these silly uh, tropes and stories that are told or questions that are always asked, then. Uh-huh. You know, I actually thought about you when I was writing this because I, I use the well, I use the term full ter- full participants in the outdoors, right? Mm-hmm. So, you and I have had that conversation uh, many times mm-hmm. about what it is to be a participant, and my definition of that has certainly changed in the four years that I've hunted, and this will be my fifth year hunting. But um, I think uh, when we feel like divided by gender or categorized by gender, then our experiences aren't necess- necessarily being recognized as just an experience. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Oh, and that's, yeah, and that's all it is. Like yeah. we're so, like whether I'm in like a camp with all women or a camp with all men or hunting by myself, I'm not having an experience as a woman. I'm having an experience as a hunter in those yeah. moments. So Sarah and Lindsay are here and they, Nicole said, yeah, I'll be on your podcast, but they have to join me. <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm, you I'm, asked me to find other women. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Is it like, do you but, know but any you, other women who hunt you fish? And I was like, no. You, <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait. One. So she made it sound. These are actors that I paid. Okay. Um, yeah, they're paid just, by the Green Decoys Foundation. Yeah, she found okay. me down at the co op, actually. I, yeah. I, I was really? like, so like you buying like, some granola. Some, and, I was buying my, my vegan. Uh, yeah. I'm, pay, I'm paying them $12 an hour. Okay. And, great, um, great for this town. Yeah. So, They're going to give me some nice vegan recipes. After I, uh, this. The, the, because you, <laughs> you you didn't hesitate when I said, do you have any friends who you think would be good guests? You said, oh, yeah. Yeah. And you gave Absolutely. Me. So that, that gets me to the two of you and your backgrounds, just for our, the sake of our audience, but also... Uh, Nicole talks about this. Uh, is it an experience that I had as a hunter or is it an experience I have as a female hunter? Um, am I saying that right? I mean, does, does it, it... Yeah, I mean, it gets it, a little convoluted, right? Because, I mean, I'm a woman, so I'm going to experience things that way. But I think that... Um, I mean, I remember having a really good conversation with Giannis and... Uh, Annie Racer and Brittany Brothers back in my meat eater days. Mm -hmm. And we were all telling our kind of first hunting stories after that first season um, on the meat eater podcast. I think it was episode 31. If anyone wants to go back and listen to me. (laughs) (laughs) Talk about hunting. Meateater.com. Yeah. Podcast number 31, Um, Nicole, Giannis, and Brittany. But no, it was a cool conversation because, I mean, the first thing that Giannis pointed out was, well, those don't sound like women hunting it just sounds like people hunting you know what i mean it's yeah. it's still the same story because before you f- were fashionably late uh Lindsay and sarah were talking about and did you call it deer camp or just hunting camp deer camp yeah we just called yeah, it deer, deer, camp. deer camp deer camp it was all women 18 18 women mm-hmm. ages 12 to 57 12 to 57 yeah wow yeah can i send my video crew next year when you do that <laughs> 
<laughs> we are. Or, we already or, have a. Or, or is it what happens in our dear Cam? I think we're going to film it. Lindsay and I have been talking yeah, about, we've been talking it, about filming it. it. Okay. Cool. Well, but it might be fun to have some help. <laughs> so, Nicole, you didn't come to hunting, quote unquote, as a mentor, lifelong person in the hunting world. No, no, I didn't. You'd be the classic adult on set. Yeah, I um, I like to classify myself more as a first generation hunter than like an adult onset hunter because I don't like sounding like um I got a disease <laughs> so, um, or that you know uh, so, like and, and people are like well you could argue that hunting is a disease and I'm like you know what shut up like I don't want to hear that argument so the flip side <laughs> is for the two of you then it's congenital it, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? it's a congenital yeah, it's a hereditary <laughs> disorder yeah. yeah so Sarah tell me your your my, background, my hunting of, background. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always interested yeah. to know anyone. And and again, this isn't gender specific. This is sure. hunter to hunter. Yeah. So I grew up in the Appalachian part of Maryland, where the state gets real skinny, kind of crammed between Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And my mom's family is from West Virginia, so she also she came from this family of hunters, but didn't help hunt herself. And then my dad's dad grew up in Southern Virginia and um, kind of grew up as a, a dirt farmer, and they really hunt hunted in a subsistence way. I mean, my dad grew up eating canned squirrel and, you know, eating fish out of the town creek. And um, <laughs> when I got into hunting in adulthood my, on my own out west, my dad would tell me stories about how Pap Pap used to, he used to squirrel hunt and Chuck Taylors because they were quiet, like moccasins. And, you know, I got to hear all these sort of, all this family history that I, I really didn't get when I was a kid. But, um, but yeah, so like, you know, raised on venison, learned the word trachea from watching dad process deer (laughs) (laughs) um like totally like in in it from the food perspective but not not actually really hunting myself and then like I think what happens with a lot of a lot of girls who grew up in hunting families we sort of get socialized out of it like before Mm -hmm. I could take hunter's ed I was in girl scouts and then none of my friends were hunting and so and then you know some rough Family life was maybe a little rough for a little bit, and I moved away when I was 18. Okay. And so I got back to it um, in New Mexico, actually. And my my husband and I were, um, we weren't really eating much meat at the time, and I, I went back to my dad's and had venison, and I just missed it so much. And we also were, you were really into just all kinds of mountain adventure sports at the time, but it was starting to feel a little soulless to me. And you know, around about my mid twenties. And so I kind of, I kind of needed to get back to my roots, I guess. And that's, that's when we took up elk and deer hunting and Ooh. dad gave me his 264 and I still, I had it, just had it rebarreled and I still hunt with it. And we've had a bunch of oh, successful experiences with it. So I always carry that, yeah. carry that past with me and have some of Pap Pap's old rifles. And, that is yeah. cool. I wish I had some of my some functioning old family rifles. I have one, but it doesn't work. I actually have my dad's um, 870, Remington 870 12-gauge. Really? Wow. He killed one deer with it, so I guess maybe... Uh, but then uh-huh. it was um, a, a yearling buck, like a little button buck. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, he passed away when I was 15, so a long time ago, and I wish I could ask him all these stories, but uh, the gun itself is really funny because it's more of like a home protection gun. So it has like a 20 inch <laughs> barrel on it. And then it has like a magazine that holds eight rounds. Uh, so it's like, it's, and it's like, it's a cool, it's like a wingmaster. So I'm getting a new cool. barrel for it. It's going to be my bird gun, but yeah. Cool. So it's pretty cool to have my dad's oh, gun, even definitely. though he wasn't a hunter. Yeah. That's really cool. I also hunt with a, a family gun. Uh, my grandma gifted me her 308. Oh she, man. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. So her grandma's gun is the first gun that I ever shot. Yeah. Yeah. And I shot my first elk with it last year. Grandma had a 308. That mm-hmm. could be a country music song. <laughs> it <Yes>. could be. <laughs> grandma had a 308. I like it already. And I don't know if this is just like family folklore, but my uncle told me that it was the first 308 that was sold in Montana. And Whoa. I don't know if it was just of that particular the Winchester or, or whatever, but hmm. who knows? That could totally be made up, but would it I still like work? It. I would yeah. expect that from Ellen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Lindsay, where did you you grew up in Montana? So then? I grew up in Montana. Uh, I'm from Helena, but my family is from Lincoln, which is a little town in the mountains, um, yeah. just on the kind of the edge of the scapegoat Bob Marshall yeah. um, in the Blackfoot 
corridor. Um, and I'm the only one of my generation that hunts uh, in my family. Uh, my grandmother was was the hunter, um, and she taught both of her sons to hunt. And then subsequently, my dad taught me when I was 12. I asked to do hunter's ed, and, uh-huh. and um, he would take me out deer hunting. And, and then kind of, yeah, like Sarah says, I think you kind of get cultured out of it a little bit. Um, That's an interesting and I had a daughter, observation. I had a, a daughter when I was in my early 20s, and, and that kind of took a lot of my time and energy. Um, yeah. My mom had a son when she was 16. Yeah. Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, she just turned 17. So I think she got cultured out of a lot of things and cultured into some others. <laughs> yeah. <I thought>. yeah. <laughs> but she had six brothers, so... Uh, she she probably didn't have to hunt. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think Ray, and, uh, there, when you said that, what went through my mind is, you know, childbearing and and mm-hmm. raising kids, and as sexist as this may sound, of very often, whether it's in the professional world world or otherwise, the women in our society, it's it's not sexist. It's just like a reality, right? Yeah, it yeah. is, and, and so does that. Well, and I was also a, a single mother. Um, I had a, my marriage ended kind of badly um, mm-hmm. early on. And so I was the sole provider for my daughter. And, yeah. Um, so there were other things that had to take priority. Oh, but now that sure. she's older and self-sufficient, you know, I was able to to start incorporating things that I love back into my life. So cool. hunting was kind of... And she really got to have her first hunting experience with the three of us. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I took her to Nicole's deer camp last uh-huh. year. Um, and she was pretty uncertain about what to expect and was pretty sure that she was not interested in hunting. Um, and from that experience, she asked in the car on the way home if she could take Hunter's Ed. So oh, Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm, I don't want to put myself in the mind of the audience or the listener, but... There's probably some uh, surprise, if that's the right word, of how many did you say were at your camp? I had 18 women. 18 come. women at a deer camp. <laughs> uh, I, w- it wasn't w- really like an intent, like it wasn't an intention. It, the whole thing really wasn't, the only thing that I wanted to do, I have so many wonderful male friends that I've been able to hunt with. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was just hard to make it happen with the women that I knew that hunted. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of put it out there on my Instagram and I was like, would it, and I was expecting to get like, you know, four to six people, you know, there were like a couple people that I thought like Sarah and I have talked about hunting together for a long time. Like Lindsay, it's a given. Um, Lindsay and I have been friends since like the first six months that I lived in Bozeman set like seven years ago. So, um, I just put it out there and I had more than 50 women, reach out to me um yeah so i think like what what that immediately said to me was whoa there's like there's a dearth of experiences for women who want to do this but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a dearth of experience for women that want to hunt i think that there are plenty of men that are incredible partners and 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 invite women into their hunting spaces and into their hunting camps and i don't see it as um i had a long talk with leon tani about this actually like uh, you know um I think people get nervous when they hear about like a bunch of women getting together. <laughs> but but Why? it's not but what? I don't know. He was we were talking about silos. Um uh and maybe you should get get nervous. I don't know. Um but we were talking about like how things can get siloed and it can seem like there's men in one corner and women in another corner and people of color in another corner and people of different sexual orientations in another corner and um they they you know there are all these dividing lines of identity right now competing. But I think that like what happens is um it's just nice to be in a place of sameness sometimes. And I think that goes for men and women and mm-hmm. everyone in between. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're disconnecting from another space. I think you're just investing into um, one that's really important and doesn't really exist as much for women. I think it's um, probably, and this might be a huge assumption, but I would guess that there are a lot of all men camps out there. That's not a huge assumption. <laughs> <laughs> That's driving up and down any Forest Service road right. in yeah. October and November and seeing 
where are the women? Kind of looking around, like, is this like men's only thing? What's the deal? I mean, yeah. I, even though uh, some of the women in my family hunted and fished, mm -hmm. they weren't regulars at quote unquote deer camps mm -hmm. or, or yeah. stuff. I, I, and when Sarah said that you kind of get socialized out of it, it, until you said that, it never dawned on mm. me. I mean, that yeah. sounds pretty ignorant. I'm old as I am. Uh, it's like, oh, I went this long. And it never dawned on me. But it, yeah, it's it's not often a you know a space that's run by women. That, that I mean, yeah. I think that I think what that camp signified is that there's something um, in hunting culture that's becoming in women's hunting culture that's that's changing and that's that we're taking more leadership roles and we're not just participating that we're that we're creating new spaces and sometimes we're you know inviting men to them and sometimes we're not and yeah i mean i wouldn't invite any men if i was you <laughs> <laughs> i have some lovely male hunting partners i mean I, my favorite but male i mean my favorite hunting partner is male and I mean, he's fantastic and I don't feel like he treats me any differently because I'm female, but yeah. I think that the the great thing about this hunting camp last year was that there were a few women that were kind of new to the experience. And oh, it, totally. Yeah, we yeah. had three observers. And come. it felt so, like, really... people that had never been around hunting, oh, okay. had never hunted. It felt really yeah. comfortable as a space to kind of like ask questions that might you might not ask around men because you might feel stupid or um judged oh, oh, and that's that, kind that of internalized because, so my wife is a astute observer of how men interact with women when they're quote unquote mentoring mm -hmm. mansplaining and, mansplaining okay <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, see, I, didn't, I didn't know that term but you said something about the way that we, the women something you made it the, the when you the way you said it Lindsay, mm -hmm. it was as if it was the the way the woman received it instead of the way the guy dished it out my wife says yeah. i'm the worst instructor of shooting in the world yeah i think it can be different when difference. you're a partner <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? yeah. Oh, okay. yeah 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 all right i, I don't think know it's also maybe not only a gender thing that makes a difference but the difference in experience yeah that's level yeah. and um i think when people come from a like a, an experience level where they've been doing something for a lo really long time, they're pretty, you almost forget what it's like to be a learner. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, if you're, if you're a woman and you're coming, there might, there might be a good chance that you're coming to it as a learner and your mentors are people who are, are really experienced and they might not have a lot of mentorship training and they might all happen to be men because just because of the way hunting demographics have gone over mm -hmm. time. And, and that, doesn't necessarily that's like related to gender but it's not right. necessarily right. only gender okay that, if that, that makes sense that it does but it doesn't give me any excuses for my behavior well, <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, I have to catch myself sometimes when i'm when i'm sort of you know introducing someone to a new activity and it might not just be it might not be hunting it might be mountain biking but hmm. I, I have to remember that that they're dealing with a lot of uncertainty and I'm making a lot of assumptions and they don't about the way I'm going to act and they have no idea what I'm, I'm going to be doing and I don't know what their comfort level is. And it's, it's a lot of work. It's a totally different experience. It's a different style of communication yeah. too. And I think like I coached sports and um, rode horses and uh, when I was younger and well, I still ride horses, but um, I don't coach sports anymore. When, when I, Think about um, like the type of communication style you have between someone who's an expert. There's often um, a line of communication that gets missed, and I can remember like two particular trainers. One was not a particularly great writer, but he was an incredible communicator about how you could become a better writer. Like he could see and he could explain like the little nuances of what you were doing wrong to make you better in the saddle. Another writer that I knew or another trainer that I knew was a top level trainer. I mean, people were paying hundreds of dollars to ride with them, but he couldn't tell them like the head from the tail of a horse. He could get on their horse and make it do incredible magical things. And you're like, Oh, this is what my horse is capable of. But then he'd get off of it and you're back to the, you know, you're back to yeah. the same point that you were with your horse. And um, that's a frustrating thing to see. And I think it's sort of the same thing within hunting culture when you have people that have been hunting their whole lives and, you know, they're pro prolific in a way in the way that they've been successful. 
um, it's a really hard thing for them to pass that knowledge on in a way that um, is kind or considerate or even just understanding what the holes in someone's learning might be. Um, I mean, one of the things that I learned on my first hunt that nobody knew to teach me was like when I walk up to when I was going to walk up to my buck, like I needed to poke it or throw something at it and mm-hmm. like figure out if it was still alive. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that. And my buck was still alive and he bounded away and I wasn't ready with my gun. And, you know, it, it was a traumatic experience for me. It was a traumatic experience for the deer, but, but I learned from it. Right. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, okay. So now when, if I take Anna hunting, mm-hmm. right. Anna is Lindsay's daughter. I've known her for seven years now. Like if I take her hunting, like it's going to be really easy for me to walk her through all those beginner steps because I had to learn them the hard way yeah. as an adult. Um, but I think a lot of people in like the lifelong hunting position, you know, they've been packed on their dad's backs from the time they were three years old. And like you get to learn a lot from observation, right? So I don't know that necessarily a lot of the things that people are learning in those like familial traditions are things that have ever been said. They're things that have been shown. Right. And I think that that's also a different type of learning. So um, yeah, I I would... I think that what Sarah is saying is um, just spot on. I, I, it makes sense that there are more men with experience in this world. There are, you know, um, somewhere between eight and nine men for every woman that hunts. So yeah. um, we're not necessarily at a disadvantage there, but when it comes to hunting with each other, like we certainly are. Yeah. Um, and we have to really go to different lengths to figure out how to get together and have these experiences. You know how many people are going to want to come to your deer camp after <laughs> listening to this? Yeah, it's already it just has to make crazy. it season long. You, 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 <laughs> so you're going to cap it yeah. at 20 or whatever. I don't know so. how to cap it, though, because I want people to have a space that they can come to. Yeah. You know, um, we did a pretty good job about spreading our pressure. We had girls that were elk hunting. Um, Sarah was hunting mule deer and she brought one of our observers, Kate, along with her. Um, a lot of us, we had four or five girls from out of state. We had five different states represented. Um, oh. Two women, one woman, Cindy States. I don't know if you're familiar with Cindy at all, but sure she's involved with like, like BHA and that whole side of things. She's She's a great woman. She drove from Indiana. And then um, we had another woman, Amnesty, drive from Michigan. So, um, and then Oregon, Washington. I know Cindy. I'm, yeah. I'm just like, oh, I'm yeah. so embarrassed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Shout out Cindy. <laughs> hey, Cindy. Sorry, Cindy. <laughs> She'll definitely listen to this. Yeah. So. <laughs> what up, Cindy? Yeah. Love you, Cindy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, any of the three of you can answer the questions, but I'm going to ask the five questions that you brought up in the article, Nicole. And this is I'd be interesting. Of, like I'd be more interested to hear you guys think dot com. <laughs> Yeah, since enough. we already have your answers. Yeah, you have here, my answers. Sarah and Lindsay get to <laughs> chime in here. The first one, um, in the, the it's uh, the title is "It's time we kill these five topics about sports women." with the subtitle of a demographic shift is underway in hunting and fishing as more adult women pick up rods, bows, guns, and licenses. Yet as one friend puts it, the struggle for women, uh, for sports women is real. All right. That was Chelsea Cassens out of Oregon. Okay. You might have seen her articles in the New York Times about her hunting elk. She's a pretty incredible woman. I probably have. The first question or the first thing we have to get over is, do you actually hunt and fish? (laughs) I'm I'm saying that like some guy (laughs) who is looking down his nose, like, (laughs) you really hunt and fish? Like, really? Yeah. You you should have emphasized, like, really instead of actually. (laughs) Do you really (laughs) hunt and fish? But anyhow. I don't... I, okay, I'm just going to throw the whole thing, I mm-hmm. think, because I don't know if I've ever had that question posed or that I think it's industry feedback. specific. Yeah. yeah, and I'm also not super deep into the industry, so. If you traveled to trade shows, I could see you getting that question all the yeah. time. Yeah, I'm sure. That's really like the, that's the big one. So I can give my answer in multiple mm-hmm. parts. My uh-huh. first response <laughs> is... Come look at my freezer, son. (laughs) That's the obnoxious response. Um, (laughs) um, My second response is that I've never been asked that, but I also don't work 
directly in the industry the way Nicole does. I don't go to the shows. I'm, hmm. you know, I'm a freelance writer. I don't, um, I just don't, I'm adjacent, but I don't encounter that directly. Did, um, if you've I'm, never, if you've never been asked it, have either of you felt like someone was questioning that with, um, without them saying it? I've, I've gotten maybe more specific questions more, more around, um, you know, are you actually hunting alone and mm. kind of, are, are those, are those guys over there, your group? Um, mm. like but, out in the field. Yeah. Out in the yeah. field. Um, but, and I, you know, I've seen other things like a friend of mine won a rod box here at a raffle in Bozeman and it's, it's on her truck and she loves it. She was an avid angler, mm -hmm. worked at a fly shop and, uh, the, there are guys in the audience who were like, you're not actually going to use that. Give it to me. Oh, <laughs> so, um, that can, that's the thing is like that. Well, yeah. as Lewis and Clark would have said. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, that instinct is there in a lot of men. And I think that's really what catches me off guard because I don't think initially, so I'll say this as someone who works in the industry definitively and has for a while now, um, you know, I didn't experience it experience it as much in Bozeman, but once I started going to trade shows mm -hmm. and especially once my title changed to hunt and fish editor, mm -hmm. right? Because before it was like, oh, I work for, well, I guess I got it when I worked for backcountry hunters and anglers too. <laughs> but I think that's like a question that everyone on staff gets there um, because there are a lot of misconceptions about BHA. Uh -huh. um, so yes, when I was introducing myself as the hunting and fishing editor at a swath of trade shows, um, even at Outdoor Retailer or ATA, really like uh, SHOT Show was the uh, the bearer of all the bad news. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of how SHOT Show is in general. Right. Um, it should, it could be considered a form of capital punishment. <laughs> to go to SHOT Show. <laughs> really? If, yeah. if you've never been to SHOT Show, take my advice and don't ever go. Yeah. Um, but. And trade shows are currently the bane of my existence. I have to go to a lot of them. But um, yeah, once I say my, my what my title is, um, it's almost a knee-jerk response that I get that question hmm. from people. The other response I get is, whoa, that's really cool. Tell me about it. Right. Yeah. So like you can sort of, you can kind of know a lot about someone if that's like their initial response, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I would say that like, I don't think that there's a lot of malintent behind that question. I think that I'm also not really like a, I don't look like a shot show person. You know, I think I just dress like a normal younger person. Like I'm not going to wear camo. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not like decked out in Sitka. I'm not wearing trail boots. <laughs> That's <laughs> your problem, Nicole. I know, I know. It's Las Vegas. So mm. I'm like, I get to wear like clothes for warm weather in the wintertime. <laughs> Missed um, opportunities. <laughs> I know. Maybe I, I mean, maybe I should. I should do um, like a social experiment and wear camo the next time and see if people actually there ask me know. that question. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, that one oh. really got under my skin after a while, and and, and it's really well, hard not you. to be. It's not. It's hard not to be a at some mm -hmm. point, you know. Mm -hmm. At one point, I kind of flipped out, and I was just like, "Dude, yes, like I oh. do hunt and fish. I've been asked that question seventy times, and like you guys all need to get together and figure out what's wrong because yeah. I have nothing to do with that." I, I would no more ask <laughs> a woman if do you really hunt or fish <laughs> any more than I'd ask a guy. Do you know what I think it is? I I've thought about it a lot especially since I wrote this article and have had this conversation with multiple people, I think that the hunting industry has a bad track record of using women that don't hunt and fish as models. And, no. and these, you know, they do. No. Randy, <laughs> come on. So they I think wrote that, the like, book on how to right? do that right after so the I think NFL. That, I think that there was a lot of objectification of women. I think there were a lot of women going to those trade shows, especially that didn't hunt and fish. I think that there's a conception that like women, are tokens in this industry. And that's what I write to in the article. And mm -hmm. I, I think that every woman that, no, I know that every woman that I have worked with in this industry is someone that has bought a license, has bought a tag, has gone out and damn well tried mm -hmm. to do something. Um, and a lot of them are some of the most passionate hunters and anglers that I know. And um, I think that uh, I did run this by a lot of women in the industry. Um, I sent it to eight women before mm -hmm. I decided to publish it because I said, I want to be like, am I on the mark? Because if I wasn't on the mark, I, I would have been happy to take anything in that article out, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that 
uh, on the level. And that's part of the reason I wanted Lindsay and Sarah here is I think that like we each have like a really different connection to hunting. Mm -hmm. But I mean, for me, it's professional and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's concerning that that's a thing. Mm -hmm. So. No, we, we, we need to save that tangent for later once we get through these questions. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'd be interested in... <laughs> no, I, I know. You you brought up something that it's hard for a guy to ask the question without it sounding bad. So since you opened the door, we'll leave it slightly cracked until we get through the Okay, because I think there's a great flip side to that, too, that you brought up. What is that, is Lindsay? The, the other response that you get is like, oh, that's so cool. Oh, Tell yeah. Tell me more. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. To me, that's... A more the majority of that is when I go to the um outdoor recreation trade shows though because mm -hmm. people aren't expecting hunting and fishing to be there and if they're if they are there they're not expecting hunting and fishing to look like me so I think that like um it's really like I'm actually going to a women's leadership conference at the end of the month that I'm the first person from the sporting world to be invited. So it's essentially like 16 women go into a hut and tell your ride and they're all in different leadership capacities in the outdoor rec world. And um, we basically just jam out on like what's going on in the industry. Um, you know, what do we have to learn from each other? How can we support each other? And, um, you know, what can we take away to do better things within the industry. So I think that like mm. that is going to be a pretty unique opportunity to talk to a group of women that um, are in no way connected to what <laughs> they do on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. So this one, the next question is, why do women cry when they hunt, which should have a subtitle as if it really matters. <laughs> uh, Randy, but, we, we just need to write these together. Uh, send them my way. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like a, that's why it's Randy Newberg unfiltered. If oh. if I say it or write it, I know. And if somebody's upset, they've mistaken me for someone who cares about their hurt feelings. But uh, <laughs> so, is that a common question that women get? Do you cry when you hunt, or why do you cry when you hunt? Or, uh, what? I I will say this is based on a very small sample size that. The number of tears in households I've lived in came from females more than it did males most of the time. So why is it, why would oh I cry all the time? Why, why would I expect <laughs> yeah. that to be any different in the hunting space than I absolutely where? cried when I killed my elk last year. Yeah, and part yeah. of it is like that for me is that letdown of adrenaline. Huh? You know, it's yeah. just this it comes out, and part of it is. You know, you did just take a life and mm -hmm. that's a really big thing. And I think it's okay to feel that. And however you feel that for yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you cry or you don't cry, um, I think we should all be allowed to, to experience it in the way that feels genuine Yeah. to the experience and to ourselves. Yeah. That's why for me it was a, why does it matter? Yeah. But it must if you... If women are getting that question of the why, why implies... I think I've heard women uh, talked about in a lot of different like media outlets, of uh, one of which I worked for. <laughs> they, they talked a lot about women crying. Um, but I think that like what they missed was that a lot of the women that they were hunting with were first-time hunters. Mm -hmm. So I think that like... I think it's really natural for a first-time hunter to cry, oh, whether they're yeah. a man or a woman um, uh, or, you know, or a kiddo. Uh, so... That was one of them. Um, and then I just felt like it, the conversation that I'd been hearing on it was pretty one-sided. Um, and I feel like uh, like I pulled from Tom McGuane's, like my favorite essay from Tom McGuane, which is The Heart of the Game, um, which I read like 10 years ago before I even thought about getting into hunting. And it changed my perspective on hunting on like a whole level. But that's another story. Um, but he says uh, hunting is... I'm serious <laughs> and you better oh, think of it that way. And I, yes. and I think that, um, I, I agree with that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we all should have room to cry. You know, I didn't, Absolutely. I, I didn't cry when I killed my 2017 deer. Actually, that was the first year I killed by myself. And I was just thankful that it hadn't been so traumatic as my 2016 deer. Um, I think, and that it had been a really quick, swift death. And I got to walk over and put my hands on it and I smiled and I was like, thank you for, you know, for what I'm going to take from this. Um, but I mean, last year I just lost it after I, I don't, and I don't know. I mean, it can be differing 
life circumstances at the time too. So I, um, I'm glad that I had that experience where I didn't cry. I think that that like helped me rethink that question because it's mm. like, okay, I can take a life and I can still treat it seriously and with respect, but like crying doesn't necessarily have to be a part of it. Mm. I, uh, this is another one of those, those questions where I, I don't understand why, why it's a question. I think this is similar to a lot of what, what you said. It's like, well, what, why wouldn't it be okay to cry mm-hmm. when you hunt? Or why, why don't you cry when you hunt guy who's asking this? Um, yeah. But, and that, I mean, that's just like a very, very personal thing and no one should have to feel like they're really hiding their emotions. Um, I've personally never been asked this. I've also never, I've never, um, I, I actually feel a little bit like a cold hearted person because I'm <laughs> I don't, um, I've just never cried after a kill and I, I actually wondered if there's something wrong with me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there definitely is. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I have, um, I mean, I've cried for other reasons while hunting. But not, <laughs> oh, that um, brings up something for me. Not, not frequently. And I think I've probably made other people cry <laughs> while hunting. So just the first few questions give me the feeling that most everything in the hunting space is being asked, expected, or otherwise conveyed through the lens of the male. Yeah. And that women almost feel like, okay, how do I have to find a place Mm -hmm. to, uh, how does my piece of the puzzle fit within whatever expectation or context or questioning or whatever it is? It's just natural, right? Because it's 90% men. I have friend. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I go totally for it. just interrupted you. No. Um, but it's kind of related. I have a friend who said that he doesn't like to hunt with women because they complain more than men. And I was like, Whoa. first of all, screw <laughs> 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 Secondly, why is it not okay for me to like, if I'm cold, express that I'm cold? Like, yeah. I don't understand why that's... I hunt with men that complain... <laughs> so much that I like don't want to you know I've I've hunted with I don't know that's that's so interesting I just think it's a human experience that gets that's what this whole article about is about it's like it's a human experience that's being unnecessarily divided in some areas you know yeah and also like maybe he took somebody hunting that didn't want to go I'm pretty sure I'm the only woman he's hunted with so I was like we probably need to have a conversation (laughs) (laughs) that's really funny you're going to have to tell me who it is. Okay. Oh, you know. Uh, you know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is one that I hope that the hunting world someday gets over it. Shrink it and pink it. Yes. Mm. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, some states have went so far, and I think Montana even had a bill. I don't know what happened to it. Wyoming to did for sure. pink a qualified or a legal color of camouflage and for me it's like whatever I, I you know i hunt a lot of states where you don't even have to wear uh, a high visibility color of orange or whatever it is and but there is no doubt that there's this trend in the hunting space of pink it Sarah wrote Shrink an amazing it. article about this so i'm gonna defer to you because oh, you're the you're the expert All right. well so it's funny when I can't remember if your story came out before or after mine, but I I had I to know. I read yours and I was like, oh no, am I part of the problem? Which oh. I, I had to ask <laughs> myself the whole time I was writing that story. If I was, it was a great story. If I was, um, no, you're not. Part if of the I was problem. being part of the the problem on the blaze pink issue by drawing yet more attention to it, but my <laughs> the the point in in writing that that story um, for Meat Eater was that I I saw that these bills are a trend and I, I would never, I would never discourage or disparage anyone from making a personal right. hunting color choice if they're given that opportunity and it's, it's legal. But, um, it seemed a little bit like a misguided way to try to encourage women to participate. And I wanted to highlight, I wanted to use that as a jumping off point to highlight some of the, the, um, really effective ways to bring women into hunting, like the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program that most, or maybe all, even all states have at this point, or a lot of states have. And, and so it was, it was sort of more, uh, let's, let's shift this discussion or let's, let's encourage our politicians that are wanting to 
bring this to the table as an option to maybe look at some other things that might be harder to implement, but more effective. Yeah. Um, and also it's not really, it hasn't really been tested as much as our range, which is, was super interesting to me. It was, it's not, um, it's not as evidence-based as one of the things I learned. So why are we doing it? Yeah. Um, because it made someone feel good. Maybe. I think that like, Possibly. I feel like in a world where politicians aren't getting anything done, they're like, we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is something. Uh, I hunted Make all last pink. season in a bright pink ski jacket. Nice. Well, down jacket. But I didn't have anything else. Yeah. And I didn't feel it necessary to go out and buy this whole mm-hmm. new line of technical gear if I didn't know that I was even going to be what if I what if I'm a terrible hunter and I can't ever kill anything <laughs> like then it seems kind of pointless so I, love I have some great photos of myself hunt in my pink jacket and I know we're bright pink leggings to hunting hunt. camp yeah that's with, cool with your grandmother's rifle yep and my grandmother's rifle and awesome. for my when it was really cold I have my grandmother's like buffalo plaid wool Mm-hmm. It's like super retro. Her yeah, actual I mean, jacket from hunting. Yeah. Yeah. That's the flip side of it is like, I really wanted to be careful not to like degrade things yeah. that are associated with femininity yeah. when I was writing that story. Yeah. Yeah. I also run into the problem, just speaking personally, um, I'm five foot 10. And so the shrink it thing yeah. doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. So I generally find myself buying men's hunting clothing anyway. Mm-hmm. So... I'm a little bit outside of the conversation on that side, but I mean, I get to test a lot of crazy gear um, that I would um, thank you to all the companies that send me gear. You know that I appreciate it, but um, I I tend to be like kind of a minimalist, so it's a really weird world for me to be in. Um, I'm totally fine hunting in yoga pants and sneakers and gaiters, uh. and you know I don't care. Um, but um, I'm lucky enough to be in a job where I don't have to, so I have a lot of really nice gear. And I think that like there are companies doing really incredible things for women. Um, I think as far as like it's just easy to call out Sitka; they do an incredible job. Mm-hmm. Um, First Light is expanding their women's line. Um, I got some of their new gear. It looks like it's going to be great. Um, Proas has done a great job for a long time. They kind of have hit a little bit of a different market. Um, and I think that like what you see is that um, the industry has made up for itself like in leaps and bounds um, in the past five to ten years. And so like Shrink It and Pink It isn't really like something that exists when it comes to gear unless you're in like the big box stores and I think that like but I mean it's the same thing if you're in a big box store anywhere uh, you know you'll find some really weird you know rosé all day type t-shirts mm-hmm. for women <laughs> um, and you know uh, we use our buying power in one place or another and uh, personally I'm uh, I, I mean I ha- own things that are pink I'm fine with being a colorful person uh, and I'd hunt in pink um, if someone sent me a pink vest to wear that was legal to hunt with, you I know, I would hunt pink with you, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would do it. Yeah, I mean, why not? <laughs> I'm like, I think that. Uh, so your point of bringing it up was more of a. It's kind of a patronizing kind of. Yeah, well, I just think that there. It's a. It's a talking point that's always there. Yeah. What do you think of pink? You know. Hmm. What do you think of turquoise? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote an article called Turquoise is the New Pink oh, because yeah. the outdoor rec world has like just shifted everything that used to be pink to turquoise. Mm. And um, I received three turquoise shoes in a row um, from <laughs> companies and I was like, okay, <laughs> guys, uh, come on. <laughs> so th- this next one has to do with your deer camp. We didn't include you in We're Sorry, Not Sorry. Is it about your deer camp? Uh, it's about a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. I think but, about deer camp, camps in general or trips in general or, mm-hmm. well, and I think that even, um, you know, I'll just, I mean, I'll be totally frank. Uh, I wrote that part after listening to Jess Johnson on Ben O'Brien's podcast. Jess Johnson works for the Wyoming Wildlife mm-hmm. um, Federation and is a right. close friend of mine. And um, he, it seemed like he felt backed in a corner sort of on an accidental note that he'd had 50 plus podcasts and hadn't had any women on like the entire time. And he made it a point to say, 
you know, I didn't do that, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> and I, I um, really took pause at that. Um, it felt like uh, he put himself into a defensive position that he didn't need to put himself into. Um, and it just made me think about, you know, the majority of this hunting media world that we're in that we don't see women in. Or, um, you know, like, uh, I don't think that anyone should have to do either. Mm -hmm. um, I think that just bringing people to the table is like your next move. You know, like nobody's sitting here, you know, like we're not going to go through all of your podcasts and be like, Randy, you need to have more women on your podcast. You do know what I mean? Like nobody's mad. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and, you know, like nobody is up in arms here. I think the reality is that like, uh, you know, it's cool to have a voice. Um, I mean, Sarah and I are both lucky to work in this world where like we get to write and um, people ha <laughs> have to listen to our opinions in some way or another at some mm -hmm. point, um, or they choose to at least. And we're all welcome to agree and disagree with each other. But I think at the end of the day, um, if, you know, if women are being included more in serious conversations, then um, it's all for the better, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I I found that to be a little bit disarming and I was and just sort of go, like, oh, wait, what is this about? You know? Um, but I, I've also had men, I think say the same thing, you know, I, I've had like my buddies go on a hunting camp and they're like, Oh, you know, it was just a boy's trip. And I was like, yeah, go, you know, yeah. like I'm not, I'm not hurt by the fact that you guys want to spend time together. Um, you know, we can hunt another day. That's not a big deal. Well, this is a different it, different activity, but I go through the same thing with my husband and his friends. They're they're really big backcountry skiers and they go on backcountry ski trips and you know, he'll he'll invite me or he won't and I'm not as good of a skier as them by a landslide. And so for me to go on that trip changes the trip. Um if we were all going hunting, we're all on the same playing field and so it doesn't change the trip because we're all our skill level is is pretty pretty even um so there's no reason why we can't all go together but there might be a little bit of that going on in terms of men thinking that maybe a woman is not as skilled of a hunter or she's not, she has, doesn't have as much experience. And so she might change the trip. We have to teach her or we have to do, you know, we have to go slower or we have to listen to her complain or <laughs> about being cold. Or, you know? So I think that that is maybe a conversation that, that needs to be had between, you know, maybe friend groups or, or in the industry in general is, you know, yeah. there is a level playing field. It's maybe I'm not quite as fast as you, you know, getting up, up the hill, but that's okay. But you, don't have, you don't have to wait for me. I'll get there at my own pace. Yeah. And we can all have a great time and a great experience. And right. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me on a, at least on a personal level, maybe, maybe a number of years ago, I I'm, might've gotten the sense that I wasn't included as much as I wanted to be, but it was more about, um, going into new spaces, like, like joining archery league and, and not knowing anyone and maybe being the only woman in the room and not, you know, kind of knowing that people were going out for beers after, and maybe, maybe I wasn't, but that was like the first year I did it. And then I got to know people. And then I, you know, I, I solved this problem actually by getting my friends involved in these activities or finding, finding peers and planning my own, own trips. Mm. And being getting to be the one who in, invites people, not mm -hmm. the one who's invited. And I think that's um, like, that's, I feel really lucky to be in that place where I just can take ownership over it and I don't have to wait for an invitation. Um, but I, I still sometimes feel like, oh, maybe I have to prove that I'm like fit enough or that I'm, that I can hack it, or that I'm self-sufficient. But at least hard, with that new burden people. of proof can also be really stressful. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. like um, I don't, so I've been careful, like who I've gone hunting with. Yeah, you know? but um, I feel really guys, lucky to have the the hunting partners that I do. I mean, not not to brag, but 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> please go ahead. I mean, uh, my friend Dave, I'm going to call him out, Dave Klepner, um, Orange Glow. He has been a really great mentor and friend to me. And he doesn't, he's never once made me feel like I'm inadequate or different because I'm female, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, he is constantly telling me, he's like, I like to hunt with you because you're quiet and you, you know, go slow and you're, and you're looking and, and you're doing these things that sometimes the men that he takes on trips don't so much. And so there's different strengths that I bring to the table to our hunting trips that, mm -hmm. that he appreciates and I appreciate him. And I get invited on hunts that I decline because I know I'm going to be the boat anchor. I mean, there's some actual mountain animals who... Yeah, oh, totally. They, they invite me. I'm like, why would you invite a overweight accountant who eats Dairy Queen <laughs> to go on this hunt? And I politely say thanks, but no thanks. And I think for them, it's like, well, we asked him. So, and we knew he'd say no. <laughs> so I don't know that that's necessarily gender, but there probably is some of that gender. Just It's nice to have the option to say no. It is nice to have yeah. the option to say no. My and I think and that I, that like makes you feel like you're included, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. My wife has a standing invitation to go with me anytime, any place, anywhere that I go. Mm -hmm. um, but... She often says, you know what, unless it's fishing, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> but she knows, right? right and I think knows. that that's like, that's the communicative piece, right? Yeah. And I think that like, we can all get better. Yeah. Like the, I'm, And like the reality is, is that like, I also do believe in those spaces for men and for women and for everybody in between. I, I just think that like, um, I think that there's times to be together and there's, you know, it's okay to also have those moments where you're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, would my wife have more fun with her and her sister going doing something than her and I going elk hunting where she sits down on a rock and says, I'm not going any further. <laughs> Go get the truck. <laughs> she always uses that as her example of how much fun she had elk hunting with me. So given the option, uh, I suspect... At least in my household, it's pretty again a very small sample size. Uh, there's places where she would rather she she likes having the open invitation, but yeah, yeah, she's like, it's yeah, important. I'll, I'll, I'll pass. But that's no. still an inclusion, you know. Yeah, yeah. Huntress versus hunter. Even though Miriam says a huntress is a woman who hunts. Yeah. What's your bone to pick with that? Uh. I've been asked that question a billion times. I, mean, I don't know if you guys, I feel like a lot of this is industry specific, but like, it I just is. feel like I don't get out enough. That's the yeah, thing I feel like right now. I'm talking to that many people. Yeah, like, um, do, do, do you, do, so, introvert Lindsay problems. and Sarah, do either of you call yourself a huntress? No. No. Okay. There, there are people in this, if you want to call it industry of hunting media that introduce themselves as a huntress. And don't you forget it. <laughs> yeah. So that, I think it's an, it's, an, it's like, it's a, it's a definitive ownership of their femininity being mm -hmm. a part of their experience in hunting to me. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, I know that like, there are a lot of other definitions out there, but that's the one that I'm comfortable. I guess like for me, it's like, I don't want to besmirch another woman and say that she's doing something for reasons that I'm like imposing on her, you know? Oh. Mm -hmm. um, it's not for me personally. But I've been on a couple other podcasts, and I don't think I've ever been on a podcast where it didn't come up. And I'm like, really? Like, um, I'm even working on something right now that, like... Uh, where what didn't come up? The word huntress. Oh. And the question around it. Mm. I, if it's the, the correct protocol, I apologize to all those I've offended for not using the term, but I just say hunter and angler referring to the... I think that that's... Yeah. Yeah. And it is what it is, right? I think that uh, I did stand-up comedy for four years in Denver. Oh, really? I did. I did yeah. not know that. Yes, in my 20s. And hmm. um, it was, back then, it was a comedian versus comedian. And I we always thought that was, like, so silly. Um, like, none of us called ourselves a comedian. Um, but it was kind of just a running joke between every, I mean, there are plenty of running jokes among the stand-up stand comedian uh, community down there. But... Um, yeah, I don't know why, why create, you know, something that's separate where, 
mean, separation can just be together. Doesn't need to be. But do you think that in our bigger society, especially with the internet, with social media, we try to find those communities where we feel more alike and less, I guess, different? I think by it, nature, it, we're like tribal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that's a big part of why our politics are as weird as they've become is I want to just hang out with people who I think are like me, think like me, act like me. And I, I find myself just by accident or maybe unintentional falling into those trends. And I'm like, oh, I got to go over here. If you saw my bookmarks, what I do my morning reading, it's... You can't pin me to be anything. It's like, <laughs> I'm here to exercise my mind every morning for an hour. I want to hear some of these way different I ideas feel the same and, way. Yeah. and perspectives. This, is, uh, and, this topic's one of the things that I love about being part of the hunting community, actually, is that I feel like it's one of the last bastions of our society where you can enter a space where you have these deeply held values with other people and you might have completely different political opinions Mm -hmm. Uh and you can still share something that's just so so important in your lives. And there, we just, it's so hard to do that now. And I really, and and I say, I say that Sarah, because so much of my daily life is consumed by this community of Mm -hmm. hunting that I almost don't get to see what the rest of the world looks like. So when you say the rest of our lives or our world is so politicized, I sense that somewhat, but I, Maybe I purposefully avoid it. Maybe I stay within our little campfire yeah. here so I don't have to deal with that. But Yeah, I don't I mean, I think uh identity is an important topic right now. And I think that like it's kind of hijacked a lot of conversations in ways that um I don't know that was ever intended by by um different communities. But I, I think that like when we talk about something like Huntress versus Hunter. I mean, really, it's just a like a defining word. I mean, if you say, oh, you know, like let's say a name like Aaron, right, which is like a non-gendered name, Aaron is a huntress, like you're going to take away, like not only is she a hunter, but she's a woman from that sentence. But if you say Aaron is a hunter, like Aaron could be a man or a woman, but like they're just a hunter. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, as a writer, I like keeping things simple <laughs> and and like using the word Hunter is a lot. I mean, the one part that I get like a little bit like, ah, like what's the word? Sportsman, like sportsmen mm-hmm. and sportswomen. I know. Yeah, because like I when we when we want to incorporate that's... hunters and anglers, you know, you're always saying hunters and anglers and differentiating. I mean, I'm both, right? Mm. Sometimes, not really, but you know. I, do you think <laughs> at times we get too worked up about this stuff? Too, we 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 worry too much about how people are going to perceive us, and they really don't perceive us as having any bias. It's just you know, that's, that's how he or she is, or that's how we communicate. Or I mean, we we could get into some serious minutia in this stuff. That I wonder does it does it matter? But then you also get to that place of yeah, it really does. Cer- certain things of this really does. I think matter. it matters when it comes to what your values are, because I think that like if we all share the values of kindness and respect and an attempt at understanding, even if we can't completely understand someone, then like we can all meet in the middle anywhere. Like I think that if we're sharing communal values, we're able to understand each other better or at least like have everyone be in the room without a fight. But I think that like when those values are, you know, being overcome by whatever other needs that people are feeling. I mean, I'm dating someone right now who's like a pretty staunch conservative, but like he's also, he shares the same values as me. So like we can be in a room together and not fight about politics, (laughs) you know? Um, So I think that it's like, it's sort of interesting to like be um, in this time and place where the internet takes away a lot of your moral capacity for understanding because you're looking at a screen, you're not looking at Lindsay. You know, I'm not looking at Randy when I'm talking to him. I'm looking at a screen with a mm-hmm. icon. You know, I think that 99% of the time, if you put two people that are fighting on the internet in a room together, it's not going to be a terrible situation. 
No, it, it's interesting that you say that, Tara, that this is a, I don't know if safe space is the right word, but I'm glad to hear that. I've been looking for all the optimisms <laughs> of, of hunting lately, and I've been finding a lot of them. Nice. Uh, Shane Mahoney. Uh, Conservation Santa. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. Uh, <laughs> he and I were uh, together in Park City for dinner and a couple other things, and he said, man, it just seems like talking about this stuff, we can get so drawn into the negatives, and it's uh, and maybe it's just a function of our society or whatever. And then I said, well, Shane, listen to what you presented today. You talked about the fact that we share, and every culture in the world admires people who share. Well, who shares more than hunting and fishing? Everyone in this pl- on this planet that is worth talking to has a great love for wild things. They may not choose to hunt them or fish them, but they still love them. And so I rattled off all these points. And so Sarah just added another point of optimism to my future about hunting. Glad so. I can Aww. bring some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm right. I mean... <laughs> Well, I I hope you are also. One of the things I often tell people is that I think hunting helped me in so many places in my life that I don't, I I didn't realize until I started getting a little older and having more experiences in, and for me being a CPA in business life, uh, hunting was such a great teacher and I I had no idea that, oh, I'm going to take on this task that I can only control about 2% of the elements. I'm going to fail 9 out of 10 times, maybe 19 out of 20 times, but I'm going to still keep doing it and keep doing it. So when you go into the business world, it's like, well, I can do that. And if it doesn't work, well, I'll do it a different way. And if, you know, if these variables are there, well, I'll figure something out. And so I don't know, do either of you have things about hunting that have really become good lessons for life. Yeah. Um, hopefully I don't go down a dark path. Here, no, but let's go. <laughs> we, we can go Get anywhere dark, you Lindsay. want, Lindsay. I, I do think, um, given uh, events of recent days, um, one thing that was really sticks out for me is just the appreciation of life that hunting has given me mm-hmm. and how precious and, and short and... Um, you know, that we can impact a lot of things by our actions. And I think that to to walk up to an animal and and see the life drain out of its eyes is is something that, you know, you you can't get that anywhere else. And it gives you this this really, really deep appreciation for how fragile life is. And um, I I, I don't think you, you can't get that anywhere else. And I think it's missing from a lot of our society and yeah. no i i would agree i that's when one of you were talking about uh, the, you know you cry uh, the first time i shot a deer here i am with my dad and all the old mentors wearing their macking off you know and i'm kind of had to step around the other side of the pine tree there because uh, i was not ready for the emotional reconciliation that came with watching this deer's eyes get that bluish green tinge mm-hmm. to crazy. it yeah and i'm like oh, man if this is what this is all about i i think i'm i'm gonna eat chicken <laughs> yeah, that might not be for me <laughs> i don't know why it was so different to do that than to go to uncle marvin's my my dad's brother had all these chickens and i had no problem taking care of them but I don't think I had to look at it and it wasn't this larger animal and it, it just didn't have the full effect it was a, a ugly chicken that had been pecking at me every day and birds are aliens okay maybe that was it but I, ha- I had that same awesome feeling and, and even dinosaurs. to this day I, I get grief a lot of times on our video stuff because I always thank the animal and I get, you get grief for that? Oh, yeah. Oh, send, them, send them to me. Yeah. Well, it, my dad it, would it, give it, those people a dressing down. That's oh, really? Sure. Yeah, oh, my, yeah. My dad taught I mean, me that, too. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's, see, here, I'm, I'm among friends here today. <laughs> I can see that. But oh, my gosh, Randy. For me, We it, need it's, to have a conversation with these people. Yeah, it's, it is this just 
the gravity of what you're saying, Lindsay. This is a life that yeah. is no longer here. And I did and, that. Yeah. I <laughs> made That's the conscious decision that you're the one. And, mm-hmm. and if I can at least say thanks and use every bit of it to the degree that I'm capable. Mm-hmm. Huh, I say thank you and I tell the deer, like, I say, thank you, you're going to feed my my me, my friends, my family. Like, your life didn't end in vain. And, like, that's something that I say every single time. Mm-hmm. And it's, like, um, even when I'm bird hunting, at the end of the day, like, it's, like, thank you. Like, I'm going to use as much of, you, of your body as possible to nourish. And I, mm-hmm. and I think that, like, uh, that connection, <laughs> I think you've heard of, like, the stages of hunting, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, I think as adults coming to hunting, um, we kind of skip a lot of those stages. You know, I never went through a stage where I was bloodthirsty and ready to kill everything, but I've definitely mm. been around other hunting friends that are. Yeah. And um, I, and like, I, I honor that with them too, right? I mean, I think that we all have our learning curves. Um, but for me, like Lindsay was saying, you know, like I had to experience some pretty, like the loss of my father when I was young. And it's like mortality has always been something that has been a part of my mind and a part of my anxieties and my worries. And hunting has allowed me to process all of that. Um, It's been an understanding that, uh, you know, in death, um, life still keeps giving. And I think that that's something that whenever I'm eating an animal that I killed and even in animals that I don't kill at this point, like I'm saying, thank you. Because like, if it's a burger at a restaurant, like there's still a life attached to that. Mm-hmm. And um, so, I don't know. I think uh, it, it is serious. It is necessary to understand that like we're a part of the system. And I, I think that like, it's good for us spiritually to be grateful in those mm-hmm. moments. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think we, I am still trying to learn to have gratitude on a daily basis in my life, but hunting is something that teaches deep lessons about that. And I maybe that's why one of the other reasons I love hunting season so much is because it's, it gets, it gets me into all of those little habits that kind of put me back in touch with what I feel like is real and really important in life on a regular basis. And, um, yeah, like but, turning the phone off. And yeah, <laughs> like yeah, being in like a wild a place and uh, like understanding animal behavior and yeah, like, and thinking about the things I actually care about, like yeah, migrations on large landscapes and breeding behavior, and not what's going on on my phone. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah, Just sitting like dazed out in front of my laptop, like how do I write another thousand words? Yeah, I don't know. And that's like, oh, go ahead. no, go ahead. Oh, I think like related to that it's taught me so much patience because that's that's like the yeah, one me too lesson i have to learn that steals success from me when i'm hunting and then i you know i have to take that into the rest of my life to and discipline the, the fact that habits add up and yeah but i think another thing too is that um it teaches me that i'm more capable than i give mm-hmm. myself credit for and that's yeah. that's really important for me to remember because I'm really... Yeah, you went on a badass elk hunt. hmm Yeah. And you brought out your meat. Yeah. And I cried again on that hunt because <laughs> this is related. <laughs> <laughs> I took a bad shot and I blew out um, a front quarter, a front mm-hmm. shoulder. And I was really upset because I had to leave that meat. And mm-hmm. so I can't, I couldn't honor, you know, using that whole animal... Um, and that, that was really upsetting to me. Um, and then recently I cried about that hunt again <laughs> because <laughs> our freezer blew out Oh, and no. we had to throw away about 40 pounds of meat and it was traumatizing. I think anyone who hunts eventually has the freezer mm-hmm. failure problem. Yeah. So I have a little nightlight in the same plug is my freezer Mm -hmm. i mean if i'm out of town for a week yeah it might happen but every night when i walk in uh, after i park the car i look over to make sure that the little night light's still on because i had that same thing happen is that that just pisses you off yeah it's horrible it's It's devastating yeah oh yeah 
But I never want to experience Lindsay that called again. me and it was like one of those phone calls that you, like, you dread receiving. Yeah. <laughs> it was like something terrible happened. I was like, what's wrong? <laughs> uh, so I got to ask if you're from Lincoln, Montana. I am. Yeah, yes. No, I, yeah. knowing you are. Okay. Uh, Cecil Garland. Yep. Did you know Cecil? I, I knew Cecil not well, um, but I know his daughter. Becky. Um, Becky, yeah. yeah. He and she and my my dad went to high school together. Oh, okay. Good friends. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. Becky is one of uh, our CPA clients. Oh, great. And uh, well, I can say that now because I'm no longer a CPA client, but she's really more of a friend than she yeah. is anything. She's wonderful. Um, and we're doing a film. Uh, I called Becky. I'm like, hey, you know your dad in that scapegoat wilderness thing? He's an untold hero. Yeah. Uh, we need to do a story about that. So and is her grandmother, though. Well, is your grandma a, involved in to that? To a smaller extent. Yeah. To a smaller yeah, extent. Yeah, she was. But yeah, advocate. she was involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And, but to be fair, there was a large community effort to make, make that happen. And Cecil, mm -hmm. I would say, was kind of the, the forerunner for mm -hmm. that. But um, it was a, there was a very big grassroots effort. Yeah. for the scapegoat and I think that that's it's a really great success story on what can happen yeah. if you're if you're willing to to put in the effort the first citizens initiated mm -hmm. wilderness area in yeah, the entire it's wilderness system I didn't even know that it's amazing yeah that's cool oh you need to go and read Cecil's testimony to Congress when he went back there okay. it's I have it I'll, really? I'll send it to you it's it's really compelling mm -hmm. um and then you think of the context of the time, and let's face it, at the time, it wasn't real popular to no. say, hey, let's quit putting roads in here. Let's not log this. Let's not put resorts and stuff. Let's make this elk and deer and grizzly habitat. Mm -hmm. And when you're the guy who runs the little hardware store in Lincoln, Montana, that sells to all these guys who are going to make money by building roads, and that takes a serious stiff spine to yeah. say i'm gonna do that anyhow so so uh, ellen owned lambkin restaurant right? well her father built lambkin restaurant and then lambkin's bar and restaurant and yeah. then um there's a hotel there's a i don't know if you've been there but mm -hmm. there's a big two-story log hotel and he built that and was the proprietor of that for his lifetime um so then she took it over um they sold the bar and restaurant but she ran the hotel yeah um and then actually sold it to my other grandparents. Um, oh, funny. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think anyone who travels Montana needs to go to Lincoln, not to see Ted Kaczynski's yeah. little cabin in the woods, <laughs> no, yeah. but to go to Garland's and Lambkin's and all the other cool little places. And when you get out of Lincoln, I hope... You ever been to Trixie's? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Trixie's is a <laughs> legend. <laughs> How far is that from Lincoln? Um, 30, 40 to, miles. Yeah. yeah. To Evando. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah I'm, man, we, we should, this podcast should be sponsored by Montana yeah. Tourism. <laughs> Go to Lincoln. So, but, well, I think, yeah. I mean, that's an, it's an amazing area to me. Um, to hear my grandma's story is, you know, a, packing into the, the scapegoat and the bob. And then you, you find all these other families like the Garlands. And um, uh, there were actually a lot of women that were really, really involved in, um, there were women run outfitting businesses. Um, you know, it just, I don't, it's a cool area and it's, it remains cool um, in Ovando you know, the organization that I work for, the Blackfoot Challenge, um, are doing great things for conservation and, and hunting. And um, there's just a lot of great things going on up there. And, and there's a ton of wilderness and yeah. to explore. And It's just badass country. Yeah, yeah it really yeah. is. If anyone ever gets a chance, go to the scapegoat, the bob, all the stuff, Rocky Mountain Front, all from Lincoln North. Yeah. It's really cool it's stuff, incredible. but the, we're we're telling we're in the process right now. In fact, tomorrow we're floating the river. Do you know Jim Poswitz? Yeah. Okay. So Jim, the the Yellowstone River was going to have a dam on it, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. down at Livingston. It would have flooded it way up into the Paradise Valley. And so we're floating the Yellowstone with him tomorrow. We've been, we're a year and a half into the film that we're doing called The Dam That Never Was. Oh, cool. And Amazing. Uh, Jim is who turned me on to the, the scapegoat story. Oh, cool. 20 some years ago. And I'm reading the name. I'm like, I'm going to ask Becky if she knows this guy. <laughs> the same last name. And so I asked oh, Becky. Funny. She's like, oh, yeah, my dad. I'm like, oh, <laughs> open mouth insert but here. Uh, but there's so many cool stories about landscapes and conservation. And hunting connects me to those in a way that if I didn't hunt, I don't think I would know these stories. Or they, if I did hear them, I don't know that they'd have the depth and meaning to me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that they do now. And so we're, we're doing a whole series of them. Uh, the Dam That Never Was will be the first one. And then we're doing a bunch more that are smaller five to eight minute stories. And the common thread on all of them is that conservation is never easy as the scapegoat. Mm-hmm. certainly shows uh it's always uncomfortable like the uh, allenspur dam shows uh, jim and his fellow fwp employees got reallocated mm-hmm. uh i guess that's the former way of saying we're gonna fire you um yeah. and it's always inconvenient yeah. If, yeah. if we're only gonna do important conservation work when it's convenient well, we all have great, big, long, busy to-do lists and lives and families and commitments. So I guess we're not going to do any conservation if we only do it when it's convenient. So. Well, no, and I think um, that story, like the crux of what I'm doing these days is like, how do we tell the story to a broader audience? Because mm-hmm. I think within the hunting community, we're really good at telling the story. And I think that like it's become, you know, it's something that we're all like emotionally, physically and I like to argue spiritually connected to. Um, and I think that, you know, before I hunted, um, I was an avid backpacker. I did 150 miles on the Continental Divide Trail by myself um, and did a lot of hiking. And that was sort of my introduction into the outdoors. Um, and it was all like I was a total beginner and a total idiot and had no idea what I was doing for the most part. But um, I also had no idea what was underneath my feet, you know, um, like to walk through the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest and not even understand like what that heritage is to understand, like even just on a general level, right? Mm-hmm. It's like I grew up in Colorado and you'd see the Brown National Forest signs, but like you just saw them on the way to the ski hill. Yeah. So like, I think that they're, it's almost crazy to me that um, this heritage of ours is outside of the public consciousness so deeply that it's taken for granted and completely misunderstood. Mm-hmm. So um, it's really easy for a lot of the uh, anti-public land rhetoric to like to spread, sure. because like people don't have a basis or a knowledge of history or a knowledge of why these things are there. You know, like maybe I got two paragraphs of um, the Theodore Roosevelt, you know, Midnight Forest story in like a college history class, but you know that was after. You know, uh, I'd been through to three other classes and was just trying to memorize stuff for a test. So, Sarah, growing up in Maryland, when you moved out west Mm -hmm. and all this public land and all this cool conservation stuff, was it? Because I I had that feeling when I moved from northern Minnesota, even though we had a lot of public land, but maybe there was in Maryland. But I don't think of Maryland as a public land place it's really not we had patches where i grew up and i grew up right across from a state park so i had a taste of it and then the the state forest where dad would cut wood and used to hunt and and then the cno canal is a national historic park so i knew i had i had a taste of what it was like to have kind of a long trail system and to have some conserved land but i and and also um i learned how to backpack in the dolly sods wilderness in west virginia and that was a you know, bigger introduced me to what a bigger landscape was like. And once I, you know, once I kind of got that in my system, I wanted more. And so that's, I mean, that public land is why I moved West when I was 18. Really? Yeah, absolutely. And just (laughs) wanting more, wanting more space and yeah. Um, And, you know, I don't, but it's, it's funny. It's the reason I, I moved West, but I don't think I 
started to see it as the conservation issue that I do now until I started hunting. Yeah. And that, you know, like, like you were saying about your, your project you're working on now that, I mean, that's another important thing I've learned from hunting is that it's just completely, you know, even as someone who started out with an ecology background, it's complete, hunting's completely changed my view of conservation and um, kind of given me the, a kick in the butt to be more involved too. From hunting. Yeah. You, you think hunting provides that motivation or kick in the butt more so than just, okay, I got my degree in biology or I am. It's, it's, uh, you know, I think it's different for everyone. It's a different, um, it just feels, it feels different to me. It feels more visceral. I have more, you know, I have more on the line because it's what, it's what I eat. Yeah. And uh, it's, and, you know, like Lindsay was saying, it's a, because it's a matter of life and death, I feel like we're, um, we're engaged on this, this deeper level. I mean, not to take anything away from the people that are doing great conservation work that's, you know, not mm. related to the hunting motivation. But, um, I, I mean, I think there's something really powerful about sort of knowing that you are part of a very long tradition that's integral to human history and wanting to keep that alive for the next generation, knowing that, um, you know, we have something really unique in the North American model and that it's important to be stewards of that going forward. And I, there's not, there's no other framework like that for any other recreational group. Hmm. And I mean, I think that's what the type of work in the Coles doing, trying to bring that you know, bring hunting and hunting ethic to different audiences is so, so important. Well, for me, I, because it, it gets back to food. For me, hunting has always been, it started with food. It's always about food, even though, yeah, I love the adventure. I love going and doing other things. But from the time I was five years old and my dad walks in the house and plops this white tail down on the kitchen table and we're going to make this into food. Well, my eyeball to eyeball level as a five-year-old is this deer with its tongue sticking out and some blood dripping out of its <laughs> nose and its eyes already that bluish green color. Mm -hmm. And at first, I'm, Dad, what are you doing? <laughs> and over the course of a few hours and a few deer, it's like, well, this is how we eat. This mm -hmm. is, and it wasn't a true subsistence lifestyle, but it became very obvious to me that the land and its productivity is where I get my favorite thing to eat. I, mm -hmm. One of my fondest moments in my parenting career was when my son decided he liked deer heart as much as I did when oh, I was a kid. I was like bumping my chest, <laughs> like, that's my boy. I'm I right got there. to share deer heart with my nephew Yeah, for the first time when he's, he's three. Uh -huh. And um, I brought, after my hunt last year, um, I hunted out in eastern Montana, and the first place I went was my, it makes me want to cry, actually, <laughs> like to be able to bring it over to my sister's house and share it with my sister and my family, and um, I live like a mile away from them right now, so yeah. like being able to be close to them has been really important in light of a, a lot of other things that have been going on with my family, but uh, Charlie, um, we cooked up that deer heart, and everyone was so reluctant reluctant to try it and he was just coming back for more and coming back for more and coming back for more and it's like um and it's the first time that he came into my apartment he was just walking around and he was just like pointing at my deer and he's like oh auntie coley i like your antlers and he's just like <laughs> sauntering around and like you know asking me about my bows and so like it's really exciting to have like this prospect of you know a young person that i'm going to be able to like really take with me and yeah. have and his dad's never hunted before and um my brother-in-law um just in the last year he like wrote me a long text message and he's like i have a really important question to ask you and i don't really know like you're, you're probably gonna say no and like it was all these weird text messages and then he's like i just i really want to go hunting with you and i was like oh yeah like come on <laughs> you know and it, he like thought it was gonna be a, like a big thing and like no like absolutely like absolutely come you know yeah. so um it's cool to see that i think that like that idea of venison diplomacy is is a real thing uh, I, you know? I agree I, to me that's why it's if someone is asking me about where this passion for public lands and conservation comes from i use the old analogy of well a farmer cares about his field mm -hmm. yeah well I, hope so. I care about the place that my my food comes from where pretty much my entire 
culture, history, whatever you want to say of me, my family, and the communities I've belonged to mm-hmm. have come from. It's all attached to that land. And so it's, for me, it's, it, hunting has provided a connection to all that, that I don't, I don't know, maybe I could have got it somewhere else, but. Well, the, and the closer you are to something, the more you are able to care about it. And I don't think you can get any closer than, you know, your hands in a body. In a body. Yeah. On. <laughs> it's really it's true. But yeah. if you step step back from that and we realize that there there is a, a a really large portion of the population, the majority of the population that doesn't have that connection or even close to it. For the so, first time in human history. Yeah. Really. And so how do you um how do you have that conversation and how do you talk about that and say this is important uh, without, you know, scaring people with imagery of, you know. Right. Do do you think women are better storytellers about the hunting experience than men? No, I don't. No. I think that, that there's a. I think there are some conditioned stories among like the younger male community where there's like a lot of machismo tied to hunting. Yeah, and I think that like. Um, same, I think when, that's same when they're skiing, same when they're yeah, mountain yeah. biking, yeah. same when they're fishing. It's the big T word. I yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely, and I think that. Um, you know, I think it's easy to point fingers and talk about grip and grins and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but, um, you know, there's also a, a lot of content out there that's really heartful and thoughtful. You know, I don't think that it's as one-sided as it even felt maybe when I was first getting into it. And that could also just be like the changing nature of social media. Right. So, um, I don't know. That's what I, I, I have to say. I was just curious about it. because most of the storytellers, if if you believe that we're using media, whatever form of media, to tell the story of hunting and conservation, it is as male dominated as the act of hunting itself. I would say probably even more so. There's a larger percentage of the quote unquote messengers who are male than there are actual hunters who are male. I think that's a dis... Yeah, I would say that's yeah. largely disproportionate. And I think, um, you know, and Sarah, you're welcome to jump in too, but when Lindsay and I were, we've been talking about this for a while, like there, um, you know, people will send me videos of like a woman fishing or a woman hunting, but it's an all-male crew. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's an all-male production team and an all-male editing team. So then... It's like, we don't really know what stories women would tell. And so like one thing that we were talking about um, was like really, we both have nice cameras and um, we can document, you know, probably as well as some of the more beginning (laughs) documentary people out there. Well, it's not that we, it's not just that we have nice cameras. It's that we have, I mean, I am a professional photographer. Yeah, you're you're a professional professional storyteller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we've been talking about how, what, how would we tell the stories if it yeah. was up to us? And, and um, we've been talking about approaching that. And I'd be so fascinated to watch how you told the story. I think it would be really, really fun yeah. to do. And, and I think that we have like all these little avenues to explore, whether it's our deer camp, um, you know, whether it's like going out. Um, I killed my deer last year by myself on public land. Mm-hmm. Um, I killed my deer the year before that. Um, by myself in the backcountry and packed it out in my good old mystery ranch backpack that I've had, you know, since before I hunted. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that like there are women out there doing things. Sarah has killed an archery mule deer solo. Right. Yes. Yeah. That that's the, yeah. That's the story that I. That I'm just making sure. I'm not messing it up. I didn't. I not did, fake news. Yeah. Not fake news. No, you did that. Um, you know. So I think there are like all these women having different experiences out there. But like, uh, for me, like, it, um, I've been approached by different friends and different groups to ask to film me when I hunt, and at this point, I've said no, and it's just because, uh, it's such. Honestly, like, it's hard for me to think about, like, kill, like, since I killed my past two deer alone, like, it's something that's become, like, very, like, personal Mm -hmm. to me. So, like, how do I tell that story without, like, breaking my kind of bond and promise to myself to, like, make that an experience where, like, I'm disconnected and, you know, not touching technology, 
you know, and like, do I want to be on film doing something mm-hmm. like that? I, I don't know. Um, and that's like, a like, but then I get to see people, you know, like you telling the story and doing it in a way that's um, helpful. Right. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, but mm-hmm. no, no you, know, you know, come on. Well, um, I, I, the reason I, I asked that is we were all at the 2% for concert. Yeah. Were mm-hmm. we all the, yep. oh. Mm-hmm. Yep. oh yeah, you should, you showed up fashionably late again. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there was a preview of the Wyoming Migration Initiative and a person from Wyoming was producing the film. Mm. I can't remember her name. Is it Anna? Might be. But I have it written down the, somewhere. She she followed this mule deer uh, and just in the whatever two, three minute teaser clip, it just seemed like this is a completely different story. Mm. It felt so, I don't know, honest and almost... Um, a little bit more vulnerable than, and maybe that's, yeah, maybe that's the key. Maybe that's a thing too, is that as women we're allowed to feel that. And, and maybe sometimes it kind of goes back to that. Why do you cry? Mm-hmm. Because we can. Yeah. Uh, I'm totally okay. being vulnerable yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, so the, the fact that in a two or three minute teaser, it struck me that this is a completely different lens that someone is going to tell a conservation and maybe hunting story. I don't even care if it's a hunting story. It's a conservation story. I want to see it. Yeah. I'm like, when is this going to be out? So whatever the three of you are thinking about telling stories and how you plan to do it. I hope you do, without the confines of what, oh, well, let's get enough views or Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and that was like, that was like the point of Deer Camp anyway, is that I think there are also like a lot of really manufactured spaces for women, which I think is good. Um, What what do you mean by manufactured spaces? Like they're like like a non-profit or, you know, a space where you're going to learn like like the becoming an outdoors women pro, like program it's a manufactured space for women to come okay. and learn not in a bad way oh I, yeah, yeah. I, Sorry. I the context of manufactured yeah, in no, my world I don't is know. usually that artificial was probably the wrong or word. forced or, okay no 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 i i guess stru- structured is probably okay. more what i'm saying so like when when i wanted to have a camp i was like i want to have a casual place that's like you know it's not sponsored by Mm-hmm. you know, a boot company. <laughs> Those yeah. Like, sure. yeah. Like, and people don't have to come and like sit through a two hour seminar right. on, you know, how to take apart a deer. It's like, let's just come and bullshit. And, um, you know, I bring BYOB. We had an mm-hmm. amazing selection of wine and whiskey and we ate really well. We and great we food and it, we laughed our freaking faces off and, and we stayed up late and we got up early. And I mean, and we put meat on the table at the end mm-hmm. of the day. So I think that, um, and, you know, put in a lot of hours on the ground and it was public land DIY, um, BMA hunting, the one mm-hmm. deer that we were able to BMA, kill. BMA, block management yeah. area. So not everyone is listening yeah, from sorry. Montana, I'm Nicole. So. Dang it. But, all right. But, but yeah. Um, and we actually, the Lindsay got us some private land access and that's where one of our gals was able to fill her tag. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was hard hunting and it was crazy weather and gale winds and snow. What and rain. time of year was it? It the November? first week in November. Okay. We were up in the crazies. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was really fun. So I have a friend that we, we have these conversations a lot, and um, he likes to play devil's advocate all the time. Um, but he argues that it's almost easier to get into hunting as a woman because there are these spaces that are, like, tailor-made. And I don't know if that's true, and, I, uh, you know, I don't I, have the, I, I the would same disagree. experiences that he has, but... I would disagree because how, what's the likelihood of one of your friends, say you're, you moved to Bozeman, you're going to college. What's the likelihood that you would have encountered someone and said, Hey, I'm going hunting this weekend. You want to come with Mm -hmm. pretty darn slim. Now you look at the number of guys at MSU or any college in the Rockies who might get that invite is probably a pretty good percentage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't I know. Just that, I think that if they're example, beginners, though, but... I think that it might be hard. I think being a beginner is hard, as, especially like once you've sort of grown out of childhood. Mm-hmm. Like to be like, I don't know anything about this, and I'm going to go do it is like it's a kick to your ego a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, 
And I think that, especially if you're around a lot of experienced hunters, like I can see, I mean, I've watched guys, you know, say that they have experience that they didn't have, Mm -hmm. right? And kind of like puff out their chests and like do that whole thing. We've all seen it. So I think that like, uh, I know what he's saying. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's like a like a legitimate comparison. Yeah, and I, I but mean, I, neither do, I one can't of us, understand that it's hard for adults to get into hunting. In the grand scheme of things, neither one of us are in that space because he grew up with hunting. He grew up with a dad mm. that hunts, and so he's never had to come right. into it as a beginner. And I haven't either. Yeah. Um, a, a little bit more because I put it down and picked it back up, but um, it's hard for either one of us to speak to that, but it was just a an interesting point that he made that I wasn't sure I agreed with, but I wanted to respect it. It seems like it just speaks to a need for more educational opportunities for adult just hunters of general. all genders. Yeah, and absolutely. I think maybe, maybe he's seeing like, Oh, there are these spaces, f- you know, for female hunters that are new, but mm-hmm. you know, where, you know, where, where's the, the opportunity structured opportunity for, for everybody, yeah. for everyone. And right. if your only opportunity as a, as a male is to go to be invited to a hunting camp with your friends and you're the only one who doesn't know anything and you're coming in and, and you don't want to admit that you don't know because you don't want to look, you know, silly or whatever. Um, then you might be less likely to, to pick it up. Being a beginner is being vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like, we forget that. And men are not good at being vulnerable. We we lose a lot of really? sleep. Oh yeah, yeah, really, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> uh, but I gotta ask, when he, uh, uh, and I don't want to get, I don't want to cause any marital strife here. But I've been wanting to ask this question since you told me you taught your husband to hunt or brought him into hunting. Ooh. Am I am, am I saying that? How how would we say that? I would not take credit for bringing him in. I okay. think that um, he started being interested because he made friends that hunted. And so he, he wanted to okay. know what that experience was like. However, I will say that he and I hunted primarily together since he started. Okay. What's been the fun, the, the funniest or most revealing lesson that's come from that experience? Oh, I don't, I don't want to get you in any trouble here, but we, we always have some marriage advice on the podcast. So, uh, um, you know, <laughs> do it. I'm sorry, I should have given you that. Tell the advance. story. I don't know. <laughs> I can't think to anything that would speak to like marital problems or, or but I would say, and I, I've told him this and I, so I hope he is okay with me saying this, but he has a real problem slowing down and approaching mm-hmm. it from this space yeah. of, you know, being present and, and really looking for being intentional. Yeah. He, and Nicole knows this. Um, he is a very point A to point B yeah. person. The the that's, journey is not the destination. The guys. destination is the destination. And yeah. so he is moving so fast through this landscape and he's missing things and he's... Which serves him really well as a skier and like mm-hmm. all these, yeah, all yeah, these other areas. Um, Ski patrol, all that kind of but stuff. But he is having to try to step away from that and reteach himself and he's... At, from an outside observer perspective, I would say he's struggling with uh-huh. that. Um, but it's also been great to watch him figure it out. Yeah. And um, we there was one experience last year where we were hunting um, and we came upon a doe and we were not, we were hunting for elk, but he, he was like, I'm just going to see if I can stalk, stalk her and, and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And so he took it as this, uh, opportunity to learn and it was really great to watch him figure it out mm-hmm. and, I, oh. and I look forward to doing that with my daughter too and letting her yeah. explore that space and, and see what it means to be blend into the landscape yeah. so to speak well guys aren't really good at saying oh I've never done that before no. we, we have way too much ego to park our ego requires a really big parking lot <laughs> yeah, and the older a guy gets to about age 40 that's really hard. And then when you get near 40s, you're like, what does it matter? Okay, I don't know how to golf. Someone teach me. Yeah. Or 
I don't know how to fly fish, and I live in Bozeman, Montana. Will you show me the difference between a map spinner and a royal wolf? That's like, eventually guys get there, but... I think women are on the opposite end of the spectrum to you. Like, really? the majority of the women that I know are like, that are like badass hunters would never tell you, you know? I'm not saying there aren't women out there that do, and like, good for them. Like, like tell your truth. Yeah. But, um... I would say that, like, uh, the majority of women I know will, you know, undercut themselves on either their experience and be like, oh, well, you know, I've only been doing this for 10 years, <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, okay, only, <laughs> only a decade, all right. So I think that women um, are really easy at, well, and I'll say this is the one thing about Deer Camp that when we were kind of breaking things down afterwards and I had some conversations with some of my friends who primarily hunt with their partners or their husbands who are more experienced hunters Mm -hmm. was that um, it was the first time they have ever been able to lead a hunt, you Hmm. know? So even if they'd been hunting for six or seven years at that point, it was the first time that they like took it into their own hands and were able to make the decisions and realize they were capable of making those decisions, not only capable, but, but informed. And so I think that like that's, Another thing that those spaces do for women is allow them to gain confidence in being a leader and being someone who can take the reins. And um, I would say that, you know, compared to the hunts that I've been on with, um, you know, some other people, it's a very collaborative experience. You know, it's um, it's not competitive in any way. It's, you know, um, and I think that you know, everyone was coming back to say like how much fun that they had. It wasn't like the sort of like silent stoic uh, thing. It was a collaboration and, um, and we had a lot of really close calls, you know, Mm -hmm. even in that space that was like, you know, hunting a little bit differently, but I think, you know, we're also culturally communal Mm -hmm. in in a lot of ways. And like, we've learned to lean on each other and um, I don't know. I, I played team sports, so I was always leaning on women from the time that I was small. So, like, that's a space that's really easy for me to be in. We're not mm. expected to be islands. No. No, and I think that, like, like hmm. there is there is a level of, like, being a man when you think of, like, the old school roles of provider and, uh, you know, um, being really independent and not being vulnerable. And, um, yeah, it's just... There's like there's such an effort to I think I don't know maybe you can help me with this but like just disseminating um, like gender and what it means to be who we are but like I think there are also like some truths to our experiences around gender that mm-hmm. are important to recognize you yeah. know yeah yeah I think uh, it's funny because my experiences as a growing up with sports were totally different so I didn't learn a lot of that and I I learned how to be like a bro like a lady bro. And it's uh. not, <laughs> and like I did martial, I did like solo sports. I did like martial arts and hockey, like co-ed hockey in middle school. And so I had to like tough it out with the guys and I had to like learn masculinity. And I think when I started, um, I think as I've gotten older, I've, I've realized I can actually unlearn that. And it's also really harmful to bring that to mentoring other women. And it's, it's really like exclusionary to have that kind of, Attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so if, if you leave your camp, does anyone go solo? Like this? If people I'm, want I'm, to. No. But I don't but, think that they do this in general. So does someone say, you know, this morning I'm going to drive this trailhead. I'm going to go hunt all by myself in your camp. Did, did that happen? No. Okay. Because no. I would say half the guys would say, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want someone. I'm going here if I don't get back for two days you know then come look for me I did get feedback from some woman that I invited that they didn't think that it was the right experience for them to Um, go be with a bunch of women um, you know Um, so I think that that was sort of interesting right Yeah. Um, and I'll say like I primarily hunt alone um, Mm. at least I have the past couple years Um, and I really enjoy it it's like it's kind of like the one place that I can like truly decompress and like feel really present um, and I, yeah, there were a lot of women that were like, oh, that sounds horrible. Just like being in camp with a bunch of other women. <laughs> um, and it, there were a lot of women that came that I think had that preconceived notion mm. too. And I was one of those women. Yeah. Really? It's like, oh, yeah. I was okay. like, that sounds terrible. I can't imagine. Then what, what coaxed you into going then? 
Uh, curiosity, I think, okay. and the opportunity to take Anna, my daughter, um, and expose her to that. And um, mm. I wanted to approach it as an observer, um, and so I brought my camera and photographed um, quite a bit of it. Um, We're also grateful that you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are so these images are yours then? Yeah. Some of those are mine. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah, images in the article. Credit. There we yeah. go. Lindsay. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, maybe the slogan for next year should be hanging out with other women is actually fun or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Wait, is there, is there some notion that hanging out with I, other women wouldn't be fun? Well, I, there I can mean, be. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I think there's yeah. like the, there are like those of us... I've always been able to like walk a good line between being like the guy's gal and the gal's gal. Like, um, I'm totally a girly and I love hanging out with my girlfriends and um, I have that side of me. But like, um, I mean, on Wednesday, I'm leaving to go llama packing in Yellowstone for four days with eight guys. So, you know, I, I also have to be able to hold my own there. But yeah. it's also because I've always had guy friends, you know, from my time of being a tomboy when I was, you know, four or five years old and, and on up. So, I, but I think that there are a lot of women that kind of get siloed in one or the other, and they're like a gal's gal or a guy's gal. Yeah. And I think the guy's gals, uh, there are a lot of us in hunting. Um, I'll make that observation on my own. <laughs> <laughs> like, there are a lot of women that, you know, have gotten into hunting because, like, they've primarily hung out with men. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, like, the idea of coming into a women's camp is like, oh my God, like, it's going to be catty or dramatic or you know like it's going to be ex like exclusive or you know I'm going to be excluded because I'm not the kind of woman you know um that should be in a place like that uh -huh. and we really ran the spectrum of like of gals gals guys gals and mm -hmm. everything in between you know mm. but there were women that like once we like at the end of every day um we opened up the floor and everybody got a chance to speak, um, which is, you know, 18 people. You're going to be there for a while, but yeah. we were there anyway. Uh, so everyone had the platform and, you know, there were multiple people that said, you know, I came all this way and I was really nervous and I came to hang out with a bunch of strangers. And Oh, so a lot of you didn't know each other. Yeah. No. yeah. Oh. I, um, I, I knew maybe like... Four or five people total. Ooh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so yeah, out of I eighteen, thought, yeah, I, okay, I probably was... I knew more, but but there were people that were complete strangers to me coming. Hmm. So that was like a yeah. Oof. So like Cindy drove Cindy and Amnesty drove from Indiana and Michigan without knowing a single soul at camp. Wow. Yeah. So I, I guess know. that that's probably the thing that I should lead in with. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, we should have talked about women. that at the beginning. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's so that, a, that takes a lot of courage. I don't care if you're who who you are to go and say, "Hey, I'm going to go to this place with a bunch a of bunch women of, with guns in the woods." <laughs> well, that, a bunch. I was going to say a bunch of hunters. I don't even know, but now you want to equate it to women with guns in the woods. All right, you said it, Spouse Nicole, not me. Like, do you even tr do you trust these people? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who are these people? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That makes it even more interesting. I know it's weird. You really should document this. Yeah, that's I, the plan this be, year. I think it'd be a I cool actually story. got. Um, I just had someone reach out who's a documentary photographer from LA who wants to use us for her senior thesis for grad school. And, oh, cool. Um, and she's been documenting hunters in a lot of different spaces, but has had a really hard time finding women to document. So mm -hmm. um, she's going to be coming out from LA. Are there any women who have hunting podcasts? I, I don't have enough time to consume other media content. So I did I for a hot second. I actually did like a three-part series on our deer camp, but I'm so mm. strapped for time like yeah. with everything that I've been doing. But Rachel Attila, I think, had one. I don't know if she still has it. No, she did like four episodes. Oh, really? Okay. And then there was a podcast called The Hunting Wife hmm. for a while, hmm. which I think was a play on something. Cause I, I know that she was a hunter. Yeah. She came to some of the BHA events, but I don't know if she's still doing it. Okay. But um, I have a potential offer to do a podcast for a different nonprofit, but I don't know if that's going to come to fruition. So we'll see. Hmm. But yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Hey, there, what makes me think of it. Have you ever been to the uh, shooting training of the group 
called Shoots Like a Girl. No. no. Karen. She's the most unbelievable instructor. I, so I met her six or seven years ago when she was just starting. And her and her husband told me the story of what they're trying to do. And it was about this bringing the firearm and archery training experience from a woman's perspective. It, it's eye opening. Yeah. Hmm. Every guy who, right, every guy should go to Karen's class. And she has this trailer that goes to all these trade shows, to Chacho and others. And oh, you I'll go have in to there. Meet her. And, and they will train you in firearm basics, archery basics. The teaching skills are so far off the chart compared to any guy has the talent to do. And so I told Karen, you know, I'm going to have to send my wife here because you got to break her of all the bad habits she learned <laughs> from me. Um, but uh, she's one of the people I think of in the, in the hunting space that really is embraced you know what yeah i'm gonna call it shoots like a girl and i asked her how did you come up with the name and karen if you're listening and i say this story wrong uh you owe me a podcast appearance <laughs> so you'll get a chance to correct it but someone said something to her about uh, she was somewhere and someone said oh shoots like a girl well what they don't know is karen is in the army she's She's dialed it. She, <laughs> you know, kind of how you were saying how some women let it just be understated. Yeah. She's the master of understatement. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so she said, you know what? I'm just uh, going to embrace this and I'm going to call it Shoots Like a Girl. I love and, it. And uh, it, it, yeah, the, even the archery part, you go in there and you see the training and the, and the instruction techniques are way way different the patience the the understanding it's like oh, guys could never do this and karen's like yeah guys could never do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just how we're wired i i don't know but uh i just think it goes see. back to that idea of like that kind of ingrained ability to just do something mm -hmm. that is natural you know i think that like like men get to learn like learn by doing and a lot of, I feel like men are pretty kinesthetic learners, like hands on, you know, like for me, I can get a book and like kind of pull things apart and like do things, a little, you know, like I like those, like, I like those intricate details. I always have, but, uh, that's gotta be a female thing. Cause I hate it. Men never read owner's manual. I don't know why they <laughs> I go to Ace Hardware, I'm like, I want that floor model. I'll pay $50 extra if I don't have to put that <laughs> stupid thing together because that requires reading a manual. But you know, I, the reason I say that is I, I hope that what we see is women feeling that there's the space and the interest to hear the way that they're going to tell the stories. It's going to be different stories, but they're going to be important stories. And I... I would love to see him do it. I'd be a consumer of that kind of media more than another old gray haired fart like me. Saying, cool. You know, maybe we'll lean on you a little bit. Yeah. 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 So we could yeah. Do some help. I'm like, yeah. I feel like I got yeah. the green light from Randy. Newberg I know. Here. Look yeah. at that. I do. I, I, <laughs> We're I, just going to, you'll just be like a um, special thanks to Randy Newberg. Uh, like, <laughs> or or maybe it'll be in the form of a lawsuit of Randy. We listened to you. That was bad. As <laughs> Our attorney will be in touch with you. Well, I think this is like, um, it's just awesome to have, these gals here because uh, I, Lindsay and I will like talk about stuff like this. And then like, um, I don't know, Sarah, Sarah and I have been connected for a long time. And then to be able to have hunted last year together, was like really special. And like, mm -hmm. um, it was just really personal and awesome. So like to actually say it out loud that we're doing it now, mm -hmm. I think we're put on the spot. Yeah. yeah. Did, so. did, did you feel that there needs to be some validity or some validation to the idea or is, is it just no, I, time? No, I think that like if every, we like, yeah, we're just lives? like, we're speaking it into being on a public podcast. Okay. <laughs> it's All a right. motivation to get it off yeah. the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's you, cool to hear that. that if anybody like, has any that you project feel that ideas way. out there in the, the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Hit us up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I just, I firmly believe in that. And, and uh, again, my, I might see the lens differently because or my lens through which I see it could be different because my parents got divorced. I lived in a single 
mother, female driven household for quite a few years before my mom got remarried. And, uh, you know, for a woman to lead and take command and to do whatever, it's like, to me, like, my mom's pretty damn good at that. I hope I'm as good as she is someday. I feel and, that way about my mom. And I had very influential and strong grandmother. So I, I'm always seeking these perspectives. And to me, they don't strike me as strange or weird or out of place. It's just, where are these? When are we going to hear? I'm looking around. When are we going to hear these stories? When, when, when are the platforms going to be available to them? Yeah. And I, I do think it's way easier for a guy to say, oh, I'm going to go start a hunting podcast or I'm going oh, yeah. mm-hmm. to go start a, a whatever. Just because of the, the bias, if, whether intentional or unintentional, the reality of how the demographic unfolds, it, it creates this yeah. Weird, yeah. weirdness or whatever. That I don't know if it's weirdness. Yeah. I just think that it's just the demographics at play. You know, I mean, I think that it would be like that in, you know, so, any other genre where like there's a, a majority, like the majority is going to have more of a voice. Yeah. You know? No, I, I, I agree with that. I, but I, I think we're past the point of maturity in hunting media that it's well past the time where we need more stories from, from people like the three of you who's gather up with 18 women and you know, <laughs> go to your own hunting camp. They're, they're like, I could see a reality TV series. Where <laughs> they could call in your husbands or your significant <laughs> others. So you know what's going on. Oh. We have like a separate wall tent where I'm like, hey. and then Lindsay <laughs> yeah, there you got go. into the way. Yeah. I wasn't able to take the shot. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, man, yeah, I did just speaking as you know, someone who produces media, it, the more uh, variety and the more perspectives that come to it, I think the better hunting and conservation is going to be. And mm-hmm. Yeah. I would strongly encourage you to act upon your or urge your, your thoughts of maybe doing it. Yeah. But. No, it's been in, it's been in question for a while. And I think I'd say we've that been becomes it around for like two years. Well, I think the, the hardest part is, um, like I really want to go into that experience and have like a fully vested experience. And I think that like, um, I was with, um, Brett saying on a, on a Sitka, um, shoot last year, we we're doing a waterfall thing down in Kansas. And he's like, you know, like my mentor told me you can either be the photographer and cinematographer, or you can be the participant. Right. And it's really hard to like, like if you're doing one, like, and, or trying to do both your, half-assing right you know and i think that like we had that conversation mm-hmm. even when you were shooting what you're like i wish that i would have gone all in but like you were also like yeah. participating i didn't photograph as much as i wanted to but but that was because i was also hunting and so mm-hmm. yeah you can't do both right. you have to choose one or the other so then like so, if we're filming so that camp bring some videographers yeah and then direct them yeah mm-hmm. yeah you're right We'll have to think about it. All right. It's hard. Now, this is a casting call for well, any videographers <laughs> who want to. Really, I'm inviting them women. to your. Well, for sure, women. You don't want guys showing up there, messing up your experience. No, and a guy's going to film it the way a guy would see it. Do you guys he, think that it would be like the same amount of like what we felt on that hunt if we were documented? That's a tough one because I, I've had it's the same issue you have with your hunting being so personal. And I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally, I think I'd be, I'd be okay with it and I'm getting more comfortable with the idea of sharing and documentations, but I think with a group that size and with that many, with that many people who are uncertain to begin with, I think you would lose maybe some amount of vulnerability. Like I, I don't see how you could introduce a camera into that and that. At least with with filming, we did have. Yeah. I mean, we recorded for that's the podcast, true. and and I was up in everybody's face. With that's true. Camera, yeah. I think if I you, think you did a podcast there. Yeah, I recorded three different episodes on that. 
Really? Um, Where do I find them? Um, I need to like re-up my libs in, but I'll send them to you when I do. All right. It was under the unpaved. So I, my little podcast was called the unpaved podcast uh-huh. and I did seven episodes. So um, Lindsay and I did one or two episodes. I think we did two episodes. We did yeah. two episodes talking about just about her grandma and the stories about her grandma's scapegoat. Mm-hmm. I did. Um, so I put a recorder in the middle of our circle and recorded a bunch of our stories Um, And then I went back and edited like four hours down Hmm. into like a 50 minute podcast. Um, And then I did some sort of like verite recording, like kind of on the road. Um, There was like one point where I was like, we're not going to get anything. And then people are going to give us because we're an all women's deer camp that didn't fill a tag. I had that anxiety for sure. Really? At one point. Yeah. Just because you thought there was some expectation. Absolutely. Really? I know that I would have gotten shit about it. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. From guys. Yeah, for sure. Okay. But like, not. Why? Why did you pause when I asked guys? You can just say, "Yeah, freaking guys, they're a bunch of jerks." I don't know. <laughs> you, you don't. I don't want to. I don't want. Because we're trying to like. I don't want to like try people to remove on, that. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. I don't. Okay. I like. I, but when is but if it's true, I mean, you can't, yeah, you can't right, like, right, right, right. fix it for them if that's how they're right. going to be. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree it's with not Sarah. Your responsibility. Like, well, bunch of guys, bunch of jerks. But. Whatever. I mean, so there was that anxiety, and it was kind of fun because it was like with my mom. Like my mom came to the hunt, so like we're. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's awesome. Uh, and then. So that was just like a little 15 minute thing of like me being like, ah, I'm having an anxiety attack about this. And uh, then afterwards, Courtney Nicholson, do you know mm-hmm. Courtney with the yeah. freckles? Yeah. Um, so she actually filled her tag at, at camp. So then she came and stayed with me and we recorded a podcast about her experience shooting that deer and mm-hmm. um, what it meant to her, like what that experience meant. Um, and then I had another podcast with Sierra Ling Bell and a couple other girls. And I actually have a couple that I recorded, but. Um, I don't know. Maybe I just need to like kickstart it back into action. Yeah. It's just so much time to do it all by myself. So I think that it is a lot of time. Yeah. Hey. Um, <laughs> but, but well, I, we need to talk after that. I, I think the podcast. audience okay. though is there. <laughs> the audience is beyond ripe. Okay. The fruit. I hear you. Will spoil if someone doesn't do it pretty soon. Why yeah. not us? Why not us? Why not? Why not now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. See, you are a good mentor. Look at you. You're no, mentoring the I shit am, out of us I right am now. I'm so full of it. <laughs> ask my wife. Don't believe a word he says. But no, I, it's just as someone who's interested in storytelling and the hunting and conservation and food space. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I seek out as many different perspectives and stories as I possibly can. And I, I hope that, well, you guys. You gals, you women. You well, hunters. thanks for having us on and like just <laughs> giving us a you like hunters. space to all talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Wait, did we talk about the thing that you were you were putting a pin in? You know, I thought about it, and I don't want to violate a really fun conversation with the downer. <laughs> of that, so. Next time, I don't want to know what it was. I know I now. It. Okay, you, now you have to just say it. It's the uh, so I so I've been in this for a long time. Okay. And occasionally people will come and say, how did you transition? How did you get started? How, how did you build this? How did you do that? And occasionally some women hunters in this space will come to me and we'll be visiting and da, da, da. And some of them I've known for quite a while. And uh, they bring up the idea of almost a sexuality context to why or how women get some further distance in this industry, if you want to call it industry. Mm -hmm. And if that's what they, if their goal is, I want to be somebody who has a TV show or I want to be whatever. You've got to be hot. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and like a really specific uh, way. It's, it's, yeah, and they ask <laughs> Look that. Look good in a bikini. And, and one, it, to me, it's like stomach turning. It's, it's it has. I'm not saying that someone couldn't look in the way that some people you know build themselves to look uh, and not be a serious storyteller. But as a general rule, often that becomes. Uh, the mechanism the by which, yeah, story, and yeah. then they say, "Well, why does nobody take me seriously?" 
And I don't have the heart to say, well, you're selling it here. I mean, well, that, it's a, that, it's that's a double your, edged, your brand it's a double-edged is, sword. Yeah. So that's what I was just saying. You know what? This is too fun of a conversation. Let's not even oh. go there because it, it only relates to the hunting space, hunting industry, media. Well, yeah. I know. And we can talk about that yeah. on some other point, too. Yeah. Or it's maybe even not worth it's not talking worth about. I yeah. I think that all of us would probably say, and I think Nicole said this earlier, that um, everyone's entitled to their own experience, whatever they mm-hmm. want to make that. And so yeah, if that's right. how they want to sell it, mm-hmm. then who am I to disparage them from doing that? Right. But that's not what I want my story around hunting to right. look like. And yeah. so and and I guess for me, it just strikes where more than once you get the question of, well, why does someone not take me as serious as they do so-and-so? And it's like, well, I don't know if you've looked in the mirror lately, but you, you are painting it in a way where you're emphasizing certain things in DM, and, and in the process, whether knowing it or not knowing it, de-emphasizes the quality of the story, the experience, the, the, all right, the it's things an, that we've just It becomes just an objectification, right? Yeah. And so I think that like when, I don't know, that's a huge that's cultural. Top, I think sociologists call that a double bind when you- A what? A double bind when you um, you kind of can't win for losing. Because okay. yeah. I mean, if someone's likely portraying themselves a certain way because society has told them that's what it takes to be successful and mm-hmm. they've gained a certain amount of success from it, yet it's it's detracting from their their other goals and mm-hmm. they're just kind of trapped by society at that point. Yeah. That's, that's a Even tough if they position are really to be talented, in. You know? um, and if, for me, I don't ever answer the question. I'm like, you know, I got a call I got to get to because I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of friend am I, right? But, but, I, but there's know. no good answer for them either. Like you can't tell them, hey, Dress a little bit more dowdy and quit putting makeup on in the morning. <laughs> and maybe like let your hair, you know, let your yeah. natural curls go. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that it's like, um, yeah, it is a double bind. I, I and I, I don't know if it creates because a lot of our vision or view of things is created by what we consume, whether it's media or otherwise. Does that then make it harder for people with sincere stories, like? the three of you want to tell does it create any hurdles to the space just because we are in this binary you're male or female you're left or right you're liberal or conservative you're whatever and instantly that gets a, a layer of veneer put over any, uh, I any mean, women that are trying to tell hunting stories I have like a huge uh I don't like being in front of the camera, like, you know, and I think that like, if you get into like the space of where women are talking about like how they feel about themselves and like a physical or like a looks level, like you're never going to be good enough and you haven't been since you were, you know, eight or 10 years old. Like, um, I think it's, I think it's a bigger societal pressure for us to think about putting ourselves on stage than it is for like, I mean, like any, there are like big, giant, fat, ugly dudes who have hunting television shows that, you know, like it doesn't really work that way for women. I when I see that imagery, um, my visceral reaction is, damn it. <laughs> I, I don't want to have to like look that put together in the backcountry. Like I just want to, yeah. you know, okay. like I don't want that to be the standard that I have to like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, strive to. I just want to. Yeah, I no, want it's it to be incredible safe, that women can look like that. Yeah, getting up at four a.m. I don't know how that happens. Yeah, you know how it happens. They didn't woke up at <laughs> four a.m. They woke up at two a.m. They just come, come on, you, don't be so. You said that in all jest. I am sure. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> we all know how that happens. Why do you think a lot of them wait until the next morning to go recover their deer? Two a.m. Yeah, I, man. I, I I wish we wouldn't. Even, I should have just stiff armed that. No, said, the, no, Nicole, we're not going to go there. The, the nice. The nice thing is for me, at least, as just like a person who hunts, like when I'm a, like away from thinking about the 
public portrayal of it is that the animals don't care. They just don't care. And that makes me feel so good inside. That is so good to hear. They don't, they don't care. They just they, really and, don't. And for guys, too, you know, they don't care if you're overweight, if you got four chins, or they don't care if you, you know, you weren't the cool guy in high school. They don't really care. I like The 308 that. is the greatest thing. The answer. animals yeah. don't care. <laughs> I'm going to get a t-shirt. I, I just makes everything else evaporate for me when I'm out there. <laughs> the animals. Yeah. So it's true. Yeah. So I think that that's, yeah. that's the other side of like that media portion. It's like, man, we have a great story to tell. But look at all these other things that are yeah. like knocking at the door. Right. You know, saying, hey, like be prettier, be more put together, yeah. be all of these things. Yeah. And so I think that like. There are a lot of women that have these really genuine stories to tell. And I see a lot of women even on social media, like tripping over themselves, just trying to say, you know, hey, I'm like, I don't want to put myself in the spotlight, but, you know, I feel this way. And I think that like that there's a much bigger hurdle for us to jump over just to even clearly like we've had, yeah. we've been talking about this for what, right. like 30 minutes now, yeah. <laughs> like um, of just like saying, okay, yeah, like this matters and like we can tell a good story and it doesn't have to be about, you know, who we are as women. Let's just tell the story that we have as a, as a collective experience. Yeah. And so like, yeah, but it, we, we have a lot to, of we other things. Have to put lipstick on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Lipstick? We don't have to put lipstick on it. Beautiful. <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, it was easy for me. If you're born a white male in America, you are born with and most of my audience is going to dis call me some sort of idiot, but you, you have no easier path or you're born further ahead than the rest of the crew if you were born a white male in America like I was. So the ability for me to say this is what I want to do is go tell hunting stories is way easier than it would be for someone who's female or someone who doesn't come from the cultural norm of the white male that is the predominant demographic in hunting um so easy for me to tell the three of you oh yeah go do that oh yeah this is, what took you so long why aren't you doing that no well, i'm glad we talked about it because i yeah. think it kind of it makes me really excited to pursue it yeah actually. yeah me too this conversation gives me some motivation all right so when the three of you are it shuts, stars it shuts and, down those other and, like and voices the, in the back the three that of say, you take a, a knock joe rogan off the you know, behind <laughs> podcast okay, level. Well, just, whoa, hold we, your we, we, I can say it started right here, yeah. right in Bozeman, Montana. Oh my gosh. That was special thanks to the three amigos. <laughs> Randy. Oh. It's perfect. Well, I've kept the three of you very long and I really appreciate you letting me impose on your time and your perspectives and your stories. Oh, it's a pleasure. We yeah. appreciate you giving us the space to share. Yes. Yeah. Well, I... It's awesome you, to introduce you to my hunting partners. Yeah. I mean, you've known Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. But, I, uh, Sarah interviewed me, and I I was sitting at home. I, st I still remember when you called me that late afternoon. I, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I was in the middle of my afternoon nap. Oh. And I saw the... <laughs> phone ring I, you told me you were going to call Great. at a certain time I'm like oh I forgot to set my alarm and I tried to act like I was awake <laughs> so I'm really sorry I love how the if. truth comes out that's amazing uh, yeah, but then I, you were going bear hunting and how mm, did it go it didn't go well I ended up in the hospital for a week oh no yeah. oh. so no I have when a weird, was this uh, in late May I have a weird liver condition and so I was not doing well. That's part of why I was power napping oh, wow. every day, trying to let my liver catch up well. Well, thank you for doing the interview. Well, it, it, was, it was a few yeah. days later when I ended up in the hospital. But, uh, oh, well. So the bear hunt and the bear, Yogi and Boo Boo were just. I saw a bear doing, today. Did you? Yeah. Wow. Cool. Just black bear hanging out in the willows. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Out in the sage. It's kind of uh -huh. crazy. Huh. I don't know that I've seen any black bears lately. Yeah. First one I've seen. Oh, I saw a black bear a couple of weeks ago mm. when I was riding my horse. Well, anyhow, I I felt bad when I did the interview. I'm thinking to myself, I was so groggy and tired. She probably thought I was drunk or something. <laughs> and I can't even drink. It seemed good to me. <laughs> uh, so before we leave, where can people follow you if you want them to follow you or... Uh, Otherwise, uh, 
Well, I think that the the big follow is TBD. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have to come up with some branding. Okay. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can be found on Instagram, Lindsay Mulcair. It's M U L C A R E. And that's where you do all your professional photog- photography. Is there? Or do you have a special mm. page for that? Um, also TBD. Right now, I do mostly weddings and portraits. So okay. I don't know that people would be super interested in. But I can say this: uh, Lindsay's an incredible lifestyle photographer. So if people are looking to change up their hunting photographers, or people doing gear or a lifestyle, Lindsay's an incredible photographer, and um, she did. A, incredible shots at our deer camp and I feel like you'd be an incredible asset to the hunting community in general. So I'll, m- I'll make the yeah. shout out for you. Thanks. I, yeah. I'm really bad at advocating for myself. So. Yeah. That's why I have Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> so Sarah? I can be found on Instagram at S Jane Keller, uh, where I f- post life photos and commentary and my writing can be found on my woefully infrequently updated website. <laughs> woefully uh, yeah. infrequently updated. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's sjanekeller.com. All right. And uh, occasionally you can read your columns with Meat Eater and elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> High Country News, right? High Country News. Um, Where yeah. else do you write? Uh, I've written... Smithsonian. I don't. I don't write for them frequently at this point. Yeah. But yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, well, you can Gear find junkie. a lot of my writing at GearJunkie.com. Go to the hunt and fish section, um, and then my Instagram is NK Qualtieri. If you can just spell that on your own, I'll send you a hundred dollars. I was gonna say you might want to spell that. <laughs> um, if you just type in NKQ on Instagram, I'm usually one of the top few. NKQ. Yeah. My okay. initials. All right. um, and yeah, I uh, lately I've been riding my horse a lot and kind of getting prepped for hunting season. And hopefully, Lindsay and I have always wanted to pack out with our horses. That's our so, goal for this year is to cool. pack out with our horses. Yeah, and so. I'd like to um, finally fill my elk tag this year. So that's mm-hmm. my big goal. Um, and yeah, so just been getting my horse ready and uh, I'm really excited for hunting season. So cool. Yeah. Wow. I hope that when you start that podcast, I can come and sit in and listen on time and Absolutely. tell big stories. When you invite three guys, I want to be one of the All three right. guys Perfect. to invite for guests. You got it. To have this discussion about the... I'll, I'll write an article in yeah, the interim about... Yeah, we can flip about, it around. Yeah. We need to get over mm-hmm. the, these five five, the five that topics that Nicole keeps that, talking about. Yeah, the five topics... <laughs> we wish you'd stop. The five topics sports women need to get over. <laughs> I'm not sure what those will be. I feel like there would be a long list of people who'd want to participate. (laughs) You know, uh, complaining, being cold, being cold. (laughs) No, the top one would be I really can't hear her. (laughs) Okay, so I I I don't know how to say it, but you get to a certain age and you just you can't hear a woman's voice. You do a lot of lip reading. Uh huh. Uh yeah. Uh huh. So I, I I could give you more than five. Did All you hear right. any of this podcast? <laughs> I did. Okay, good. Uh, so Just I, checking. I, that, that's, that's why you look at, I get to run the modulation here for the volume, and mine is set slightly higher than everybody else. Oh, good. Nice. So, yeah. 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 The power stays where it begins. That, so that's, <laughs> there you go. Well, folks, before I say anything incriminating, uh, anything that is going to get me in further trouble, we're probably going to call it a wrap here, but I want to thank Nicole and Sarah and Lindsay for being here and for sponsoring a camp with 18 hunters uh, who just happen to be women. I think it's cool. I hope it's 36 this year. <laughs> Lord only knows. We'll see. Yeah. You know how many people are going to get a hold of you now, Nicole, I'm saying. I hope how so. How do I get in on Reach that? out. Right. Yeah. If if I can't take you hunting, then we can connect you with someone that can. Okay. You just like, said reach out. How are they going to reach out? My Instagram. Instagram. Oh, Instagram. Yeah. NKQ. Is that what you said it was? Yeah. I mean, and you can find my name on Gear Junkie. If you're junkie. good on the internet, I'm sure you'll you can find, find her. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope all of you have a great hunting season. You too, Randy. Thank you. Uh, you too. Look forward to Thank hearing you. and reading the stories. Thanks for listening, folks.